vote. Uh, but uh, we're delighted to see you all. At a time when uh, America's energy costs are tied to the whims of dictators like Vladimir Putin, our hearing today will explore how our nation can promote uh, American energy security by facilitating investments in innovation uh, and, among other things, climate solutions. To help inform our, our conversation today, we'll be hearing from a panel of of uh, expert witnesses who are joining us in person and, and remotely. And we welcome you. We thank you for your willingness to participate in what I believe is, a, is an important conversation and, and frankly, a very timely conversation. Uh, I believe it was Winston Churchill who said, the further back we look, the further forward we can see. Think about that. The further back we look, the further forward we can see. And uh, when we uh, look to find solutions for rising fossil fuel prices here and around the world, uh, it's helpful, I think, to look back at history for some, some help on those answers. Since the Arab oil embargo of 1973, many in Washington have argued that if we uh, just, just drill for more oil, we could be free of the price of whiplash caused by international disruptions in the global oil uh, market. Uh, that wasn't true during the Arab oil embargo, and it hasn't, and it isn't uh, true uh, today. This narrative clings to the hope, I think a false hope, that the oil market in the United States is somehow separate from the global oil market, and as some of us this, on this committee know better than me, that's, that's not true, they're not separate. So let's, let's lay out some facts. And one of those is the oil and gas industry has been slow to ramp up production on the more than 9,000 unused approved permits that they hold on uh, to drill onshore. Is it onshore and offshore? Just onshore. 9,000, I didn't realize that. 9,000 unused approved permits to, to drill onshore. Um, I had my staff double check that and apparently that's actually true. Now after experiencing uh, falling revenues during the pandemic, many in the industry are, are more interested in paying back their shareholders, it seems, that taking action to lower gas prices. High gas prices are not a result of this administration's policy. Still, the U.S. is, I'm told, a, a net export of oil products and is uh, drilling more today than we were uh, a year ago. Our nation is on track to surpass our historic pre-pandemic levels of oil production in the next uh, year. And despite this uh, increased oil production, American energy uh, prices continue to be directly tied to global events, such as Vladimir Putin's unprovoked invasion of uh, the Ukraine and the pandemic. In fact, prices at the pump have spiked nearly a dollar since Putin moved his forces into Ukraine. As long as our economy runs mostly on fossil fuels, energy prices will continue to be vulnerable to forces outside the United States. And that's not energy security for many families. It means energy insecurity. Let me just say right here at the outset, um, that we're not going to switch to electric vehicles overnight or in a year or two or five years or a decade. Uh, as much as I believe in using hydrogen for, um, to help provide to propulsion for our vehicles in, in the future, uh, we're going to be driving uh, vehicles that use liquid fuels for a, a long time. I, I would acknowledge that. It's, and uh, that's the, the reality that, that we live with. But having said that, our over-reliance on fossil fuels is also driving another existential threat, and that is climate change. Just last month, a study by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, highlighted the alarming rates of sea level rise due to climate change. For people who live on the inland in the U.S. and in the heartland of our country, they don't have to worry about this as much. Those of us who live on the coast, and um, I think about, I think it's about somebody, half the people in the United States live within like 50 miles of one of our coasts. For us, this is real and a matter of, of ongoing con concern. But anyway, NOAA estimated in the report last month that our oceans uh, will rise as much as a uh, a foot in the next 30 years without action. That's more than they've raised, gone up in the last 100 years. So it's, 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 the trend is going to continue, and if we don't do something about it, it's only going to make, uh, make it worse. If you happen to live near a coast, that's a matter of real concern for us and for our families. Increased sea level rise is just one challenge of many that Americans will face and already are facing because of climate change. Climate economic costs are starting to add up, according to GAO Governmental Accountability Office, uh, the, uh, the economic impacts that Americans are experiencing from the Russian invasion of the Ukraine pale in comparison to the economic devastation we look forward to if we fail to properly address the climate crisis. So 
instead of doubling down on an antiquated energy playbook that doesn't work uh, well anymore, we need policies that help our economy uh, smoothly transition toward cleaner American-made uh, energy. Now, now, here's some good news. And what is this? It's a scenario that's not always good news. Here's some good news. We can adopt these policies that I'm talking about while also giving consumers more choices to fuel their lives. And by giving Americans a choice about how to heat their homes and fuel their vehicles, we can reduce price volatility, we can reduce energy costs for, for all Americans. Fortunately, Congress and President Biden have already taken steps to relieve the pressure that high energy prices are putting on families and small businesses. Thanks in large part to our successful passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I would just say to our, our witnesses today, this, this is the committee that provided the foundation on which the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, was, was built and very proud of, uh, of, um, of our colleagues. But the, um, thanks in large part to the successful package of the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Biden administration is, about, uh, is able, frankly, to make some significant investments, many significant investments in, across the country from sea to shining sea and expanding domestic clean energy and infrastructure for zero uh, emitting vehicles. These uh, investments include $5 billion for a national network of electric vehicle chargers. They also include over $3 billion in the domestic battery supply chain and battery recycling. So uh, US electric vehicle manufacturing does not depend on critical minerals from China or countries like uh, countries in, in Africa. And while these uh, investments represent real progress, we can and must do more if we're going to meet our energy security and our climate goals. This is the challenge of our time. Um, we, most of us on, on this committee are married, I think maybe all of us, and our spouses say things to us over and over again, we, and we do the same with them. But one of the things my wife uh, tells me is I'm too much of an optimist. She said I need to be more of a realist like her. And I always say, honey, I love you, but I, I don't want to be just like you. I want to be an optimist. <laughs> and she says, she rolls her eyes and says, oh, well, for, why did she marry me for better or for worse? There you go. <laughs> but uh, while fossil uh, fuels will continue to power more of the US economy for, for years to come, many American businesses are already making investments toward a cleaner, more secure energy future. I think they need our encouragement and support to go, not slower, but to go faster. And with that, there are three things we can do to accelerate our transition to clean energy trans, uh, transition. First, uh, we should help ensure that Americans have the choice to fuel their vehicles with electricity from renewable and uh, nuclear energy from biofuels, from biofuels from our farmers, or clean hydrogen produced by our refineries rather than oil from foreign countries. We can do this through direct investments in clean vehicles and their refueling infrastructure. Second, we must ensure that all Americans benefit from our investments in clean energy and energy efficiency. More often than not, lower energy families and use a large portion of their household income on, en on energy costs. We need to ensure that low-income uh, communities have access to clean technologies and the no communities left behind in transition of clean uh, energy. Marines have a saying, as Dan Sullivan knows, it some, goes something like this, leave no Marine behind leave no marine behind. I think we have a moral obligation to leave no community behind in our uh, energy trans, uh, transition. Um, as my colleagues know uh, on this committee, I was born in West Virginia. Our neighbors were, for the most part, all coal miners. And uh, they, those jobs are gone. And we have, I think, a moral obligation is when people lose their livelihood to help them transition to something new so they can support themselves and their families and, and leave no family behind. But finally, we must uh, redouble our efforts to improve uh, energy efficiency and reduce weight, waste. For example, the oil and gas industry should no longer be uh, uh, able to allow large amounts of our nation's supply of natural gas to escape into the air as methane, harming uh, our lungs and climate just because it's inconvenient uh, to capture that methane. Encouraging greater energy efficiency in our homes, our federal buildings, and our manufacturing facilities lowers costs and saves energy. That's a win-win situation where I come from. If we make these, uh, these investments, I firmly believe we can break our addiction to foreign oil. We need to. Also to reduce harmful climate emissions and lower consumer costs. It's a, a hat trick where I come from. That's a hat trick. At the same time, uh, we can strengthen our national security and create good paying jobs across our country. That's the promise of a clean energy future. In closing, 
As one of the uh, strongest supporters of electric vehicles in the Senate, I know it's important to remember that we are not yet in a post-liquid fuel world. Uh, I sold uh, last year for a dollar my 2001 Chrysler Town & Country minivan that had 600,000 miles on it. There's uh, not many uh, people get 600,000 miles out of their car or, or minivan, but I did. And there's, but there's a lot of people that have vehicles on the road that uh, maybe have 50,000 miles or 100,000, and they're gonna be driving. They're gonna be driving those vehicles like I did for a long time. That's just the reality of, of, of what, we, what we face. But uh, we must uh, retain our domestic capabilities to produce and refine the motor, uh, motor vehicle fuels that help uh, power our lives and will continue to for some time to come. However, we must also ensure these fuel or fuels are as clean, as clean as possible while investing in zero emitting vehicles. Investments in clean energy and energy efficiency are the greatest long-term solutions for energy security domestically and internationally. The United States is at our best when we lead, and now is our opportunity, opportunity to do so by, by passing legislation that unleashes the potential of American clean energies, provides a lot of jobs going forward, and benefits all, all, all Americans. With that saying, we, we look forward to hearing from all of you and now to hear from our ranking member, Senator Capito, for her opening statement. I think uh, we're gonna start voting. Have we started? I don't believe so. Uh, I think we, we're gonna start 10 voting 30. at 10.30, okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we'll be going back and going you know, off to the floor and coming back, so just bear with us, if you will. We'll try not to have too much in disruption. Then we're thrilled that you're here, delighted that you're here. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Senator Capito. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chairman Carper, and I want to thank the witnesses for uh, coming here today. It's nice to see my former colleague, Jim Matheson. We, I think we came into the Congress together in, yeah. in, yeah, in 2000, and so it's nice to see you, and welcome welcome to the committee. Um, now, as much as ever, Senator, promoting... Senator uh, 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 Jim Matheson is a gift that keeps on giving. My chief of staff used to work for him, so <laughs> it's a small world. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. Now, as much as ever, promoting America's energy security is utmost importance. National security is energy security. Not only can the U.S. lead the way on energy development, we can do it responsibly with lower emissions. U.S. greenhouse gas emissions have steadily decreased, thanks to primarily to the shale revolution and America's ingenuity. But to pave the way for another American energy revolution, we need to take concrete steps to look at this administration's policies that are holding American en energy producers back here at home to benefit to the benefit of hostile regimes with appalling environmental track records. More specifically, facilitating America's um, uh, excuse me, facilitating additional American energy production will allow us to better assist our allies as they move away from Russian energy sources. Action to reverse the Biden administration regulatory policies will help us combat rising energy prices, ensuring Americans can fill up their gas tanks and keep their homes warm now and in the future. Over the last year, we've seen an unfortunate pattern from this administration. The administration policies have strained supplies, increased prices for hardworking families, limited and delayed projects, chilled investments that could yield more production, and are threatening the affordability, reliability, and new capacity of our nation's energy supply. As a candidate, President Biden promised to drop all drilling on federal lands. And on day one in office, the administration stopped all new oil and gas leasing on federal lands and killed the Keystone XL pipeline um, and they have also backed many challenges to energy projects in court. One of these, on top of these actions, activist judges have halted construction of necessary energy projects across this country, like the Mountain Valley Pipeline in the state of West Virginia or the region. As a result, the regular gas price in the United States has climbed to more than $4 per gallon, diesel's over $5 per gallon, and in some parts of our country, I think I saw in California, it's well over $5 up to $6 per gallon. These are the highest recorded average gas prices our country has ever seen, topping even the run-up in 2008. Now the administration is trying to claim, and I think I heard a little bit of this in your statement, that rising gasoline, oil, and natural gas prices is caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But prices were skyrocketing well before this. For example, the week that President Biden took it office, the average price of gas was $2.38 per gallon. It rose to $3.53 per gallon, an increase of $1.15 per gallon, by February 21, 2022, 
the date of the last report before Putin invaded Ukraine. The most recent report recorded prices at $4.24 per gallon, up an additional 71 cents. So the majority of the price increase took place before the invasion. Similarly, natural gas and other commodity prices have skyrocketed. The price of natural gas in uh, New England averaged more than $20, $20 per million BTU in January, spiking to almost 30 for several days due to a lack of pipelines in the region or the equivalent of $180 per barrel of oil. At the same time, natural gas in my region was about $5 uh, per, BT, per million BTU. In 2021, home electricity bills rose at their fi fastest rate since 2008, yet EPA is working toward a menu of new regulations targeting power plants that will make the problem worse. This is on top of the record inflation that is impacting West Virginia families who are now paying higher grocery bills, higher gas prices, and facing higher costs to heat and cool their homes, leaving hardworking Americans struggling to balance higher costs in all areas of their lives. That's what we hear when we go home every, every day. So President Biden's attack on the industry uh, are, are having their unintended, are having an intended effect. He just doesn't like the way it materially impacts voters and taxpayers. If we're serious about domestic energy security, along with reducing emissions, we need to get back to policies that encourage and utilize American production and innovation. We need to reduce unnecessarily roadblocks to vital energy projects and infrastructure. We need an all of the above energy strategy that it does include electric vehicles, renewables, and, uh, and all of the above hydrogen development, which we see. It is hard to deliver on American energy security if permitting complexities continue to pass to pose an unsurmountable challenge. Regulatory and permitting uncertainty is essential for building infrastructure to achieve our goals of energy security. Whether that's a natural gas pipeline, transmission capacity for solar or wind, or lithium mining. For too long, states and project sponsors have been stuck in a regulatory purgatory, seeking endless approvals from up to 13 federal agencies. Additionally, dozens of state and local approvals have typically required before construction. I don't know how we get to energy security and build out clean energy if a labyrinth per permitting process chills investment in potential new products, uh, projects. While we are focused on Russia, Congress can do more to support energy security domestically by expanding our production of our own resources here. We need to support American energy solutions, including coal, nuclear, and oil and gas, as well as critical min minerals essential to making those EVs that we wish in our future and other projects. These are important to our energy security and critically important to energy affordability. So some of the ways we can accomplish this is providing regulatory certainty by codifying actions that the Trump administration took to provide certainty under the Clean Water Act. We can expedite permitting and review processes by codifying one federal decision, which is in the bipartisan infrastructure package for transportation, providing lit uh, litigation certainty and allowing federal agencies to use one another's categorical exclusions, and limit red tape for gasoline and other types of fuels by preventing regulations and new fees that will increase the price of our energy. If the administration won't take action, the Congress needs to. I look forward to hearing what the witnesses have to say to bolster our energy security, encouraging uh, American investment while moving forward on uh, the environmental issues that we know are so very important. Thank you very much. Senator Kepp, thank you very, very much. And with that, Mr. Chairman, yes, sir, please. Uh, before going to the witnesses, let me apologize to the witnesses because I'm going to go ahead and vote at the top of the vote so we can operate more smoothly here. But uh, I, I think I've already read the uh, information that you've submitted. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Senator Anhoff, the former chairman of this committee and also chairman of the uh, Armed Services Committee. It's a distinguished career. And, uh, you know, I had breakfast together. We had a uh, prayer breakfast together. It's a weekly uh, event. You know, I think Democrats and Republicans don't have much to agree on. We actually, on a weekly basis, get together, read the scripture, pray, and we sang, what was the hymn we sang? Uh, was, uh, there is a bomb in Gilead. I don't know if you guys ever heard that hymn. Great, great hymn. But uh, we don't agree on all the issues, but we uh, love each other and try to find ways to work together. And especially on this committee, we're pretty good at finding the middle. All right, Senator Capito, thanks very much for, for, uh, for, for your, uh, your comments. I know you're going to be, I think, slipping out here in a minute, slip sliding yeah, away. I'll slip out first. And all right, and then good enough. Our first, uh, our first witness today is joining us uh, remotely. 
He is a uh, former secretary of the, the Navy. Uh, I, I first met him when he was governor of Mississippi. I'm former governor of Delaware. So have a, there's a, a huge bond between former governors. When I started more sentences that went up here in the Senate like when I was governor. And then our colleagues get tired of hearing that, as you might imagine. But uh, Ray Mavis, longtime public servant, governor of Mississippi, ambassador to Saudi Arabia, uh, secretary of the United States Navy. He was the 75th uh, secretary of the United States Navy from 2009 to 2017. That seems like a long time. And as it is. It's, he's the longest uh, tenure as a leader of the Navy and the Marine Corps since World War I. How about that? And during his time, he officially named one of the, the nation's newest naval uh, fast attack nuclear submarines, uh, the Virginia, Virginia class, and it's uh, the uh, the USS Delaware, which uh, was christened a year ago this April, and is going to be calling on making a port call to the Port of Wilmington in about uh, two weeks. We're very excited about that. And uh, if that were not enough, not enough, he's also been a CEO at least once, maybe a couple of times. He currently serves on a number of boards of uh, on nonprofits and, and businesses, and he's joining us re remotely today. I still call him Governor. So, Governor, you're on. Well, welcome and thank you for all your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and to the Ranking Member, Senator, that's the Shenandoah River behind me. Oh. I'm one of your constituents now. All right. Um, I better be nice to you, up. right? <laughs> I'm a voter. <laughs> so, and to the members of this committee, thank you for your efforts to strengthen American inner security. Today is for several weeks. Americans in the world are intently watching as the brave people of Ukraine fight for their nation, their families, and their freedom against a brutal tyrant. The total motivations behind Vladimir Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine remain unclear. But nothing could be clearer than his power over Europe because of its dependent on his oil and gas. Europe needs fossil fuels piped in from Russia, so Putin has the leverage and the money to undermine the security and economic independence of our allies. Putin believed that because of its reliance on Russia's fossil fuels, Europe would not take any strong united actions against his unprovoked invasion of a democratic nation. The fact that this was a gross miscalculation by Putin doesn't negate that it was a calculation that helped start an horrific war. The way to fight Putin in the long run is to shift the world economy away from the oil and gas that keeps him affluent, armed, and arrogant. Whatever we do in the days ahead to support our European allies, and we should do everything we can, we must also move swiftly to end the world's addiction to fossil fuels, and we need to start here at home. Three issues that we are facing. First, depriving Putin of the power and money that the world's dependence on fossil fuels brings him. Second, aggressively attacking climate change that is a huge national security issue. And third, becoming truly in energy independent and not subject to big price spikes are inextricably intertwined. Moving urgently to renewables is the answer to all three. The price of oil and gas is set worldwide. And even if we imported no fossil fuels, we in America would still be incredibly vulnerable to price spikes. The one thing that drives up the price of oil is instability. The kind that's caused by an irrational war in Europe waged by an unstable leader. Instability can also be driven by climate refugees, hurricanes, famine, and drought. The kind that will be ever more common in a hotter, stormier world caused by climate change. Climate change is an enormous national security issue. As Secretary of the Navy from 2009 to 17, I was in a unique position to see this. Climate change affects national security in numerous and profound ways. The storms that are more frequent and powerful, catastrophically damaging our bases. The instability and chaos arriving from storms, droughts, fires that put our troops at risk when they respond to disasters. The enormous increase in migration as people flee climate disasters and the melting of the Arctic and the great, greatly increased risk of conflict and emergencies there. I was certainly not alone in this. Every administration since George W. Bush has called out climate change as a national security risk. That is why first as a war fighting measure, then as an effort to fight climate change, I began to move the Navy and Marines off fossil fuels. Today, two thirds of the energy on our bases come from renewables. And when I left in 2017, nearly 40% at sea. The economics of renewables are compelling. Today, renewables are considerably cheaper than fossil fuels, even natural gas. 
We saved taxpayers $400 million by moving our basis to renewables. If we as a nation move very fast to clean energy, millions of new good paying jobs will be created. As businesses are finding out every day, doing what's right for the planet in the future and doing what's right for the bottom line are exactly the same. Much of the world's fossil fuel is produced and controlled by countries run by dictators. By continuing to use so much oil, we leave our economy and the pocketbooks of American families subject to the whims of these dictators. Only by pushing our economy to renewable sources like wind, solar, and agricultural biomass, which are controlled locally and essentially bulletproof from farm manipulation, can we regain our economic sovereignty. Europe has begun to move in this direction. Many nations there are getting between a quarter and a third of their energy from renewables. But this change has to be speeded up. Since, as the invasion of Ukraine showed, we're all still far too vulnerable to dramatic, dramatic swings in the price of fossil fuels. Two quotes sum it up. President Zelensky, in a recent address to German citizens, quote, we have warned your politicians that it is dangerous when Moscow decides whether you have gas and how much it costs. And James Murray of Business Green, quote, clean technologies are peacekeeping and patriotic. Putin hates them. And as much as, and so, as such, they need to be deployed at a pace and a scale that is completely unprecedented in the entire sweep of human history. Our climate security, our energy security, and our national security depend on it. America, close quote, America will not become truly energy independent until we end our dependence on fossil fuels. Thank you very much. Secretary Mavis, thank you for uh, opening up uh, our witnesses' uh, testimony. Great to uh, great to see you. Welcome. And uh, our next uh, our next uh, witness who will speak is uh, Catherine uh, Staten. Do you pronounce it Staten or Stanton? Okay. Uh, uh, Vice President of Policy and Electrification Coalition. Uh, Electrification Coalition is a nonprofit focused on transportation electrification. It is also the sister organization of SAFE nonpartisan organization focused on the nexus of climate uh, change and national security. Uh, you recognize this big. Thank you again uh, so much for joining us. Great, thank you. And transportation electrification, that's a mouthful, and so I need to speak fast, so I'll just apologize in advance for that. So Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. My name is you Catherine can, You can Stanker. slow down just a little bit. <laughs> See, I already told you. Yeah. And I'm the Vice President of Policy at the Electrification Coalition, a nonprofit bipartisan group that's working to accelerate the adoption of EVs in order to reduce the economic and national security threats caused by our dependence on oil. Our sister organization is SAFE, who leads a broader approach focused on the supply side with the same core mission. The EC has direct experience working at the I'm local- I'm gonna ask you, seriously, slow down just a little. <laughs> The, the EC has direct experience working at the local, state, and federal levels that includes acting as the lead implementer for transportation for the US DOT's Smart City Challenge, working with 25 leadership cities through the American Cities Climate Challenge, and working with companies like Pepsi to pilot freight electrification projects. We work also directly with states um, and provide direct technical and policy support. I live in a more rural part of Arizona that's 100 miles outside of Phoenix. And I mention this to say that I'm aware of the struggles facing many Americans today uh, and businesses. I'm aware of the gas prices and what that, uh, the implications for that for families and businesses. But I see that even in my community, a, a place where you wouldn't expect to see many electric vehicles, that they're still growing in, in number. Um, and we're seeing them on the roads today. The bipartisan infrastructure law laid, a cri um, laid critical foundational policies and investments to our transportation electrification future. And we applaud this committee under your leadership and Congress for the work done in passing that legislation. However, we need to recognize the scale of what is at stake in terms of our national security, our economic prosperity, American leadership and global competitiveness. And in short, we need to recognize that our electric transportation future is a matter of national strategic importance. Without aggressive action, the US risks significant job loss by ceding on advanced technology and auto manufacturing to other countries like China, who are moving quickly forward to their own electric transportation futures. We need a suite of policies adopted today aimed at electric vehicles across all modes of transportation that loosen oil's grip on our national security and our long-term economic prosperity while simultaneously reducing carbon emissions. The policies we need can be divided into four pillars. First, vehicle purchase incentives. For example, we need substantial funding for electrification of the medium and heavy duty sector, including through programs like the Clean Heavy Duty Vehicles Program and the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act 
and other EPA grant opportunities, policies which have long been supported by members of this committee. Secondly, we need additional support for EV charging infrastructure, and we support the policies proposed under the jurisdiction of this committee, such as the grant program under EPA that will reduce air pollution at ports through adopting EV technologies, and the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund grant program that will deploy EV charging stations. Third, we need funding to electrify the U.S. federal fleet. And fourth, we need incentives for U.S. manufacturing and the supply chain. And my written testimony goes into more of those details. These policies, combined with activity at the state and city levels, will enable a new area of American mobility, powered by electricity generated from domestic sources that are readily available, cleaner, and stably priced. EVs bring a myriad of benefits beyond just these stable prices. They provide fuel and maintenance savings for consumers and businesses, improved air quality and public health, new jobs in the tech and innovation sectors, reduced carbon emissions, and investment in local economies as the fuel source is generated locally. The mass adoption of EVs also provides the opportunity to address the supply chain issues that we are currently experiencing and highlighted even more by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, particularly those for critical minerals that are used in the multiple products that drive our economy, not just the, the batteries used to power EVs. States and cities are already working to adopt smart and bold policies to accelerate adoption of EVs. Whether it be Delaware, West Virginia, South Carolina, or North Dakota, states are moving forward and farming, forming partnerships and working with stakeholders to prepare for this coming funding to build out the charging along highway corridors. And the EC, my organization, we're actively working to assist states to utilize this federal funding so that we achieve an effective, efficient, equitable, and urgent deployment of EV charging infrastructure. And in fact, this week, we're launching a series of initiatives to assist states and cities with the coming federal funding, starting with Charging Infrastructure Week. In closing, while oil has facilitated the rise of the modern era, our over-reliance on it creates tremendous energy security vulnerabilities because the price of this critical, critical commodity is subject to manipulations by OPEC and global events that are beyond our control, such as those we're experiencing by the crisis in Ukraine today. So regardless of your political or technological view on electric vehicles, other nations, especially China, have continued to demonstrate a growing commitment to transportation electrification. The US government has long supported nascent industries when their success was aligned with the national interest. And we urgently need bipartisan support to implement the policies that I've outlined here today and that are um, further elaborated on in my written testimony to accelerate this future. Thank you for your leadership in hosting this hearing today and for the opportunity to provide testimony and look forward to your questions. And thank you for coming all the way from Arizona to, uh, to be with us today mm -hmm. to, to testify. Um, next, uh, we're gonna hear from uh, a former colleague in uh, the U.S. House Representatives from from, uh, from Utah, uh, someone who served with uh, our uh, ranking, uh, ranking member and probably others that serve on this, uh, on this, on this committee. And uh, it's, it's great to see you and thank you for all, the, all your service. Uh, Jim Matheson uh, today is, serves as the Chief Executive Officer of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Uh, he's also a longtime uh, public servant and has uh, had the rare distinction of being uh, elected as a U.S. representative from two different districts within his, his state, the second district and the fourth district. And in, in Delaware, uh, we only have one district, so <laughs> I, I can't match what you have done. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, Jim, great to see you. Thank you so much for, for coming and uh, anxious to hear your testimony. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Cabado. It's good to see you, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the hearing today. And uh, as CEO of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, I'm here on behalf of 900 non-for-profit electric cooperatives in 48 states. Um, I think at the outset, the point I'd like to make is a resilient and reliable electric grid that affordably keeps the lights on really is a cornerstone of Amer the American energy security and our economy. Um, and Americans Electric Cooperatives, we, we actually provide electricity to about one in eight Americans. Um, while we cover that many Americans, we also cover 56% of all the land mass in this country. So we get a lot of territory that we serve. And more importantly, we serve folks that are often in the hardest to serve, most expensive places to receive electricity. Now, electric co-ops, of course, are owned by the people they serve. They operate at cost, and we turn any excess revenue to their members. Uh, it was about one and a half billion in 2020 alone. So every action that is taken that affects the, has a financial impact on electric cooperative, it goes straight to the consumer's bill. We have no shareholders. So in short, electric co-ops are motivated by people, not by profits. 
and electric co-ops are thoughtfully exploring all ideas and potential partnerships as they work to meet the evolving needs of the communities they serve. And as I engage with co-ops across the country, I have to say one thing is clear, and that is that the ongoing energy transition must recognize the need for time, technology development, and be inclusive of all energy sources to maintain reliability and affordability. Achieving 100% carbon-free electricity generation by 2035 is simply an overly ambitious goal. American consumers expect the lights to stay on, and they expect it to be at a price they can afford. And a diverse energy mix is essential to meeting those expectations day in and day out. And to do that, America's electric cooperatives depend on an evolving suite of resources. Natural gas is playing an increasingly important role in co-op reliability and emission reductions, often replacing coal generation. But even as coal capacity declines, it remains a critical source of reliable, affordable power for co-ops in many regions of the country. Co-ops also share ownership in nuclear power plants, and they're exploring the potential of advanced reactor technology. Electric co-ops are leaders in community solar and small wind and, 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 and small-scale wind, and we also are major consumers of federal hydropower. Due in part to the expansion of renewable assets, electric co-ops substantially lowered their carbon emissions by 23% between 2005 and 2020. So we have a diverse mix across our membership. However, intermittent resources like wind and solar must be supported by always available resources with an assured fuel supply. A recent long-term reliability assessment by the North American Electric Reliability Corporation sounded the alarm on risks to reliability if too much baseload generation is retired prematurely without replacement capacity that can balance the grid by meeting short-term disruptions in supply and demand. To avoid these risks and undo economic impacts, policymakers should oppose efforts to mandate energy transformations over unreasonable or unrealistic timelines. Instead, we can work constructively to achieve environmental objectives while maintaining exceptional reliability and affordability. And if we're going to electrify other sectors in the economy to achieve lower economy-wide carbon output, reliability and affordability of the electric sector will be all the more important. Now, several programs in the bipartisan infrastructure law provide significant opportunities to electric co-ops in the communities they serve. We certainly appreciate the leadership of this committee in supporting the deployment and permitting of carbon capture technologies as an important element of power sector decarbonization. And we appreciate the support for electric vehicle charging infrastructure and grid resiliency programs, which will also support electric co-ops and rural America. But additional actions are needed. As non-for-profit businesses, electric co-ops cannot access energy tax credits that are readily available to the rest of the electric sector. Allowing electric co-ops to access direct pay tax credits would enhance electric co-op energy innovation investment opportunities. And I want to thank you, Chairman Carper, for your leadership on uh, providing a direct pay option, and also to Ranking Member Capito for your work on the 45Q tax credit. Maximizing infrastructure investments also requires coordinated, consistent, and timely agency permitting decisions in a manner that strengthens our economy and enhances environmental stewardship. Uh, the electric sector can play a major role in reducing emissions in other sectors of the economy through increased electrification. However, as a recent National Academy of Sciences report noted, Making this transition will require a threefold expansion, threefold expansion of transmission infrastructure in this country and 170 cent more electricity generation supply by the year 2050. Meeting those two objectives will require tremendous planning, investment, and collaboration among all stakeholders. Reliability, affordability, and flexibility should be the pillars on which any energy transition is built. NRECA and America's Electric Cooperatives look forward to working with this committee in pursuit of this mission. I want to thank you. I look forward to your questions. Yeah, we thank you uh, so much for taking the time to join us. There used to be a, a, a former congressman, I want to say from Oklahoma, who uh, s sat in your seat and filled your shoes. That's right, Glenn English. Glenn, Glenn. Yeah. And, and do you ever talk to him? I do, yeah. yeah. Give him our best. He's I will a great do that. colleague and, and very much a Happy to do that. pleasure of the time that uh, we served together. Uh, last but uh, not least is a woman whose name has been misplaced, mispronounced more times than she can count. And her name is spelled S-G-A-M-M-A. -M -M -A. I wanted to call her Sagama, and she says, no, 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 it's Skama, Skama, Skama. So uh, we're going to try to get her, keep, get her right, so bear with us. President, you're the president. I can tell my wife I talked to the president today. President of the Western Energy Alliance, and you are, as I understand, a former 
uh, public servant, serving three years as a military intelligence uh, officer in the United States Army. I was a naval flight officer for many years, and during one of those uh, tours, I, I was also the uh, air intelligence officer in my squadron. So they, uh, they said that I, as a, I was the abuse of the word intelligence to have my name associated with it. <laughs> I wonder, sir, why, how I ended up with that job. So, but we're delighted with your service, and uh, in this case, Navy salutes Army. Welcome uh, today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, and I, I've answered from my name mispronounced many times. That's not a problem. I'm really happy to follow up Mr. Matheson um, because that realistic time frame is, and that realism, I think, is what's called for. Um, when we look at what Europe is facing because of this Russian invasion, it's time to get real about energy. Um, you know, I've heard today that we need to get off of our addiction of oil and fossil fuels, and that's kind of like an addiction to food or other necessities of life. The reason oil and natural gas are so heavily used is because they deliver such huge value to humanity. And so realistic timeframes and for some type of transition um, requires a transition to something that's 20, that's 24 seven reliable, um, affordable. And so as it's been recognized, oil and natural gas will be part of our energy mix from through 2050 and much beyond that because of the huge value they deliver to humanity. Um, we've also heard about doubling down on certain policies like uh, mass transition to renewables. And you know, if that were the answer, then Germany would not be in the situation that it's in because Germany has spent over $800 billion since 2000 in its energy venda, its energy transition. And it is now more, rush, more vulnerable to Russia than it was before. So we in America, in the oil and natural gas industry, and I represent producers in the Rocky Mountain West, um, we in the oil and natural gas industry provide a specific solution today to making Europe and the United States, States less vulnerable to Russian oil. And that is um, implementing policies that don't require uh, taxpayer subsidies. They just require the government to stop the hostile policies against our industry and that would enable us to put in private investment and to increase production. So we have been stymied since the beginning of this administration. Uh, it's been policies of overregulation, the leasing ban, which by the way continues today because not a single onshore lease has been offered for sale since the administration started, despite a judge's order overturning that decision or that leasing ban. Um, policies that are meant to deny us of capital um, have, I mean, we cannot develop new oil and gas production without uh, investment, without credit. So that is, has been a policy that is holding us back. Um, we can also deliver the same greenhouse gas reductions that natural gas has delivered in the electricity sector, as Mr. Matheson pointed out. Um, we are the primary reason the United States has reduced more greenhouse gas emissions than any other country. So we provide actual tangible solutions to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we've done that since 2005. We've delivered more reduction than wind and solar combined. So we can help our allies around the world in Asia and in Europe um, deliver the same types of reduction in greenhouse gas emissions while increasing their energy security if we produce more oil and natural gas here at home. And um, we were very pleased to see the announcement last week from the administration of approving two new liquefied natural gas export f permits. Um, that's very hopeful. I'm hoping that is a recognition of the reality of delivering that climate change benefit around the world that LNG provides. We hope that they will continue to move forward with LNG exports as well. Um, but it's really imperative to have pipelines in order to deliver the natural gas to those LNG export facilities. And so 
policies to move forward with permitting pipelines and other infrastructure are necessary. And um, also we urge the FERC to overturn its policies on natural gas certification and greenhouse gas um, analysis on pipelines, those policies are meant to get to an answer of no on infrastructure. And so we need infrastructure so that we can export the same, export our natural gas and deliver the same greenhouse gas reductions that we have enjoyed here at home while making our allies in Europe and Asia more secure. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Ms. Gamma, thank you for, uh, for joining. Thanks for your, for your testimony again for the, uh, the time you spent in, in uniform. Um, my uh, first question is who's going to pick on a guy who's a long, far away uh, from us today, and that's Secretary Mabus. In um, Ms. Gamma's uh, written testimony, she essentially uh, says that without oil and natural gas, quote, uh, modern life is not possible, close quote. Uh, too many times uh, to count I've had uh, her witnesses uh, tell me, tell us that the deployment of clean energy was impossible and transition would result in uh, major disruptions in our energy system. Uh, and every time, uh, those predictions have turned out to not to be the case. History has shown us that we should never bet against uh, U.S. innovation and ingenuity. U.S. Business, businesses and, with the support of the U.S. government, taxpayers, have always figured out how to build it uh, faster, cleaner, and, and more reliable than, than before. As um, someone who has led uh, clean energy and transition in the Navy and in the private sector, uh, Mr. Secretary, would, would you respond to uh, Ms. Scamma's uh, testimony? Do you believe that we can grow our economy while reducing our dependence on oil and natural gas? Mr. Chairman, I absolutely believe that. And I agree that these predictions are always wrong. We just look at naval energy. Navy has led the nation in energy transformation since its founding. We moved from sail to coal in the middle of the 19th century. We moved from coal to oil at the beginning of the 20th century. We pioneered the use of nuclear for propulsion in the middle of the 20th century. And every single time, every single time, uh, there were naysayers that says this can't be done. You're taking too big a risk. You're betting on a new technology like oil and that you can never make a atomic reactor small enough or safe enough to put inside a submarine. So the ways we can do this, number one, um, renewables today are cheaper. And so it's better for the bottom line. It makes our economy, it makes our businesses much more competitive globally. Um, two, it insulates us from these price spikes that uh, basically today, American, the American economy and more importantly, American families are being held hostage by, by dictators around the world. Um, three, we, if we don't do this, as has been pointed out, um, other countries will, particularly China. And if we lose the leadership here, we're gonna lose all the benefits that come from it, particularly jobs. As we move toward more electrification, if we move toward more renewables, uh, just from the things that have already been done, we're gonna need a million more electricians just in the next few years. Those are solid, good paying jobs. We're gonna lose the manufacturing ability. We're gonna lose the ability to do the research and development that we need to do to lead in alternative energy. And if we ignore climate change and the, the effects that climate change is having due to, um, due to human activity, and a lot of that is due to the burning of fossil fuels and the huge impact it has on our economy, storms and fires and natural disasters that are increasing in severity and increasing in, in, in frequency. And last, I'll, I'll quote uh, a former Saudi oil minister um, uh, from the country I was the ambassador to. He said, the stone age didn't end 
because we ran out of stones. It ended because we invented something better. We've invented something better here, and it's time to move to it. All right. Thank you. For, before that, I have a quick follow-up question. Before I do that, I'm going to ask unanimous consent to place in uh, the record materials demonstrating the effects of global instability from Russian invasion of Ukraine on energy prices in the United States without objection. It's so ordered. Quick follow-up question, uh, Mr. Secretary, and then we'll yield to, uh, to others on the committee. Uh, Ms. Scamma's uh, written testimony also includes concerns about the reliability of uh, clean energy. One of your first acts following your confirmation as Secretary of the Navy in 2009 was the announcement of an ambitious plan to transform the energy use of the United States to move away from a reliance on fossil-based energy to cleaner sources. Question. During or after the transition to clean energy, did the Navy experience any reliability concerns? What underlying factors motivated you to endeavor in this generational transformation of the Navy's energy use from fossil sources to cleaner fuels? I'll ask you to be fairly brief in responding, but if you would, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. We experienced no reliability issues at all. And first, I would never, ever, ever do anything to lower the combat readiness or the reliability of the United States military. I did this to give us an edge. I did this as a war fighting measure. Um, my first two years as secretary, I had to find $2 billion in unanticipated um, price spikes from oil and gas. Now, even in the Pentagon, finding $2 billion that you hadn't budgeted for is not an easy thing. And so we had to steam less. We had to fly less. We had to train less which is simply not acceptable. Um, and very personally, we were losing a Marine killed or wounded for every 50 convoys of fuel we brought into Afghanistan. And so we, we began to equip Marines with rollable solar panels to put in their packs with portable solar so that Marines now make much of their energy where they are and where they fight, and they don't have to be resupplied. And last, when I was there, we had SEAL teams in the field that were net zero in terms of energy and water. And I asked a SEAL commander, what change uh, did he notice? He said, well, we had been using generators. And when you turn off the generators, you can hear when the bad guys are trying to sneak up on you. And second, you take a target off your back. Uh, and that it made him and his team far more combat effective. All right. Thank you for, very much for those uh, those insights. We've been rejoined by uh, Senator Capito, and uh, I'm going to run and vote. I'll be back. And uh, thank you all, Senator. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Matheson, uh, one issue I've talked about from time and time again is the need to be able to build up our nation's infrastructure. You talked about this in your in your statement, what issues are rural co-ops co facing with regard to permitting and infrastructure build out? If we're going to go to all electric vehicles, we have to have capacity. Uh, and so do these, are these permitting uh, hurdles, um, are they applied equally to no matter what the, the generation is, whether it's renewables or whether it's fossil fuels? And uh, so what are those challenges? Well, it, it's a great question. And as I said in, in, in my oral testimony, if we're going to, pursue any type of transition, we have to be thoughtful about how we can do this and have appropriate time. And sadly, when it comes to permitting, time is a problem. And uh, you've, I'm sure, heard story after story about the length of time it takes to have, uh, whether it's a generation project, whether it's an electric transmission line permitted. Uh, there's been efforts and talk about streamlining in Congress for years about this, uh, but uh, we don't seem to be solving the problem. Right. Uh, I, I'll mention a particular transmission project we're involved in in uh, the Wisconsin area. It's the Cardinal Hickory Creek transmission line where it's at over 103 miles of a high voltage transmission line, 1.3 miles crosses federal land. And between the state and between the, the rural utility service at the federal level and between the uh, regional transmission operator, MISO, it's taken years and years and years to get this transmission project built. And this is one that everyone thinks is a good idea. Every, everybody, wherever they are in their politics or whatever they think about different types of generation, right. they all agree this transmission line ought to get built. Um, 
And you'd like to think we could have a matter of fact conversation about the trade-offs of siting this facility and what the risks are and how to mitigate those risks in a timely way. But that's not the way the process works anymore. There's a lack of coordination across agencies. There's a lack of uh, timeliness in terms of how we can get things done. And there's too many opportunities for people to throw a wrench in the gears and stop it. I know you've looked at opportunities, try to streamline opportunities. Right. I really appreciate that. But I can just tell you from, from representing a group of 900 co-ops that are actually in the field trying to make things happen, the, the, friends, the frustration's palpable and it's real. And wherever we go with our energy future in this country, uh, this question of siting facilities is going to be part of the answer, right? Right. So I do think we have to uh, we have to stop just pointing out examples like I've just done and come up with solutions where we can have a credible, reasonable, thoughtful approach to getting mm -hmm. facilities sited in a timely way. Yeah, I mean, I think the one federal decision you were talking about, if we can get that uh, running smoothly, it would, it's certainly projected to be able to save time, energy, and at least get an answer. I mean, I've always said, if the answer is going to be no at the end, tell me no in the beginning right. Right. so I can make the adjustments that I need to make rather than drag it out, cost a lot of money, and and um, uh, cost a lot of time. Let me ask you uh, qu quickly on um, uh, global supply chains and uh, domestic and, and international. Uh, how is this affecting your co-ops? What, you, what are you seeing? I mean, obviously the price of building and building out but what are you all seeing throughout your rural co-ops in terms of supply chain issues? Great question, and it's a big problem. And it's for basic materials. It's across the board. It could be for transformers. It could be on our broadband side for fiber optic cable, uh, conductors, just basic stuff to keep the utility running on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. We're seeing great extensions of lead time to get these types of materials, uh, let alone cost increases. Our concern is that as inventories drop, we may be one major storm event away from where we don't have the supplies to uh, bring the system back online in a timely way. Mm -hmm. I get that supply chain concerns are on all sectors of the economy right now, but the electric sector, which is so vital to the day-to-day -day actions in our economy, we're feeling the pinch in a big way. I can tell you quickly on co-ops, some co-ops already had supplies that were primarily domestically sourced. They haven't faced the same challenges as some who had foreign source supply. Um, we're working within the co-op world. We have, we have supply chain co-ops that band together to try to mm -hmm. find co uh, supply. But I can tell you, uh, this is a significant challenge. It's not unique to co-ops. I know in the investor-owned utility and municipal utility, I talk to the heads of those associations, yeah. they're feeling the same squeeze. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I, th I mean, I think it's up and down whatever, whatever yeah. business you're in. Uh, we just had a school that had an estimate of what it was going to cost to rebuild from a 2016 flood. I just read they have to redo all their plans because they can't afford what the new yeah. cost figures came in. Um, Ms. Sagama, thank you for coming. I'm sorry, I, I did read your, your testimony. I'm sorry I wasn't here for it. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about what are the top issues that small oil and gas producers are facing right now and, and what how can we remove some of those barriers? And the, the, the uh, chairman talked about methane and, and I, I'd like to give you a chance to talk about what your industry's doing in terms of uh, capturing methane emissions and, and how the improvements have been um, uh, moving along. Sure. We have taken voluntary measures as well as complied with regulations that require leak detection and fixing of uh, any methane leaks. We have significantly reduced flaring uh, of natural gas. And flaring is really necessary when you don't have the infrastructure in place to capture the natural gas off your oil well. So uh, lack of pipeline capacity and a purposeful purposeful policies and opposition from environmental groups to natural gas pipelines are meant to ensure that we can't move forward with oil and gas development here. Because if we can't capture that methane, we can't even put that well in, in place. So that's one of the things that is definitely holding us up is um, lack of pipeline capacity. Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Let me thank all four of our witnesses. Uh, for your testimony and for your leadership in this area. Uh, I, I want to uh, drill down a little bit, um, Secretary Mavis, on the comment you made on cost. Consumers today are struggling with increasing costs, increasing energy costs, particularly at the pump. We recognize that. And I think one of the points that you raised that is we should be looking at is the efficiency factor of clean energy, that it is more economical 
and less costly and less dis, uh, subject to change based upon global conditions uh, if we can handle the production here in the United States and not have to depend upon supplies from countries uh, of autocratic leaders that can be disrupted for political reasons or as we see today in, in the Russian invasion in Ukraine. That's not even to mention the fact that we provide about $35 billion a year in subsidies to the gas and oil uh, community here. So my question to you is, you were talking about the cost issues in your budget, and we recognize that clean energy is vitally important for us to meet our goals in regards to the climate agenda. That's uh, clearly a driving force. But could you talk a little bit more about the costs and efficiency factors of clean energy uh, as we move forward in this debate? Thank you, Senator. You know, when we move to alternative energy on our bases, our Navy and Marine Corps bases, um, where we now get two thirds of all our energy from renewables, mainly solar and wind, we, we save the taxpayers $400 million. And if you look at businesses today, um, they, are, they are realizing that the same thing that does a good job for the planet does a good job for their bottom line because the cost of renewables have come down so dramatically and continue to decrease. Solar decreases about 10% a year, the cost does. Uh, all alternative energy are coming down and are now cheaper than, um, than traditional fossil fuel energies. So it used to be that you would have to make a decision between doing what's right for the planet in terms of climate change or doing what's right for your bottom line. That is absolutely no longer the case. And if you want stability in terms of pricing uh, to keep it from being uh, dictated, because this is Putin's oil spike. There is no doubt about that. This is Putin's price spike. This is leaving the American consumer vulnerable to dictators around the world and vulnerable to these um, acts like an irrational war. If you want to have stable prices for energy, they have to be homegrown and they have to be alternative because they, they're bulletproof from, from the world events. Oil and gas uh, in the last 40 years, there has been very little correlation, frankly none, between American oil and gas production and the price. The price is driven globally. I think we that's don't a very have much much yeah, impact on it. I think that's a very important point about the pricing that's not based upon the production here in the United States on oil and gas. And uh, your points are so important, uh, Jim Matheson. First of all, it's good to see you again, my former colleague. Um, it's nice to have you here. Uh, I want to talk about the source of clean electricity. Fifty-five percent is generated through nuclear of clean energy, uh, clean electricity. 20% uh, of our total production of electricity is through nuclear. Uh, and we don't have a level playing field. Uh, Senator Carper and I both serve on the Senate Finance Committee, and we have clean energy provisions that we hope will get to the finish line that has production tax credit for nuclear uh, to have somewhat of a level playing field. I already mentioned we spend $35 billion a year in regards to the oil and gas. So what do we need to do in order to modernize our nuclear fl fleet, to preserve what we have, but to modernize it? Because we know the next generation is so much more friendly in regards to nuclear waste materials and, and the risk factors. What, do, what policies do we need in order to accomplish yeah, you that? You may be getting a little out of my wheelhouse, but I will say this. I do think you have to have always available fully dispatchable power as part of your grid in terms of reliability, and nuclear is a key part of that today, and if you want to have a lower carbon footprint for electricity sector in the future, nuclear has to be part of the mix then as well. And as a representing the National Association of Rural Electric Cooperatives, we have a position in support of nuclear energy, understanding its value for reliability of the grid. Look, 
I think that the challenge you've got is that the, the, the limited number of plants that get built in this country, we do not have much uh, uh, practice of building them. And as a result, the cost overruns are, as you know, off the charts for the few that are being built here. We have electric co-op exposure in the plant that's being built in Georgia right now. So I think some type of effort to come up with uh, a plausible step to ha keep the cost of these resources from jumping and skyrocketing so much would be helpful. I think on the permitting side, that in reference to what I said to Senator Capito earlier, uh, the permitting of a facility, a nuclear facility, is exceptionally complicated, drags out the process far longer than it takes in other parts of the world. I think there are steps we could take to try to make this a more efficient process for, to promote the, the, the... Thank you, and we have bipartisan the, support on yeah. these issues on, on this in this committee. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam thank Chair. You. Senator Anhoff. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Skama, every American has been paying the price at the pump for this, this administration's um, anti-American energy policies that they have. And, and keep in mind, and I think it was said very well by Senator Capito uh, in her statement that um, when Biden first took office, the price of uh, gas was 238. It's now at a record high. We hear record high all the time, but in this case, you can uh, document that. The record high prior to today was, uh, was uh, $4.14, and now it's $4.25. So it's, it's these policies that are responsible for this. And this administration has imposed policies that restrict domestic oil and gas production, including canceling the uh, Keystone uh, XL pipeline and also the putting the pauses as uh, he has on the oil and gas leasing permits on federal land. So that's been going on and that's very intentional and that's what we're talking about right now. But um, Ms. Skama, do you believe that uh, President Biden's energy uh, agenda has contributed to the major reduction in the domestic oil and gas supply? I do. His, po his policies on a number of levels have um, been meant to stymie the American oil and gas producer and to buttress up the oil dictators around the world, like in Russia. So if we talk about not wanting to be dependent on dictators, um, I think the pre president has a lot to do with that. He could um, back off some of the policies that make production difficult in the United States. And I'd like to um, answer that uh, absolutely incorrect statement that the Amer American production has nothing to do with the price of oil globally. Because when um, we were able to export oil after 2015, the American producer met the increased demand globally, and we helped to keep the global price of oil down. We are the major oil producer in the world. So of course, the statement that our production does not affect prices is completely incorrect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, what today, what could the president do? What could President uh, Biden do today that would set in motion the more domestic oil and gas production and bring relief to the American people at the pump. Uh, this is something that everyone's concerned about. You can't turn on a, on a show without people complaining about this. And, and it's so obvious where it's, where it's coming from. But just today, what could, what, they, what could we do? Well, I think backing off on uh, regulation like the SEC rules right. on climate change disclosure, which are specifically meant to get to an answer of no on any new fossil fuel projects by elevating climate change concerns over real pocketbook issues, over real production in the United States. Because of course, when we don't produce it here, it doesn't mean we don't use it, it just means we import it from overseas. Import it from overseas, would you expect- And, and blocking pipelines too is a major problem. Mm -hmm. Well, would you expect a, a tax then on methane uh, uh, to lead to the increase in energy? prices. You would expect that, wouldn't you? Right. Um, there, the, the estimates are that about $9 billion of um, cost to the economy would result from the methane tax, because it's a really basically a tax on natural gas. And um, that could be as much as $85 to $240 per consumer. 
So, you know, taxing methane is meant to get less natural gas. And natural gas is used for electricity generation, to heat homes. Uh, natural gas backs up renewables, which are intermittent. Um, the cost of renewables is higher because they have to have that backup when they can only operate 20 to 30 percent of the time. That's, that's right. And uh, Mr. Matheson, they, America is dependent on countries like China, not only for the list of critical minerals, but China controls the mining and processing for the, a variety of metals in the electricity sector and used in, uh, in electric uh, vehicles, uh, now, whether on the critical list or not. Um, mandates on decarbonize the, to, to decarbonize the transportation and electricity sectors would increase our reliance on China. I think we all understand that. And was, uh, as it was pointed out by the chairman in his opening remarks, I did, uh, I have chaired the Senate Armed Services Committee. I am concerned about national uh, uh, security in a more profound way than I ever have been before, because we know what China's doing. We know that uh, back in the old days, we talk, used to talk about how America has the best of everything, and, and we did for a, a long period of time. That's not true anymore. And so that's a very serious thing. Uh, Mr. Matheson, how can the utility sector work to ensure domestic uh, source, sourcing uh, uh, for American mined minerals? Well, first of all, since we, uh, I mentioned in my opening statement, since rural electric co-opters uh, serve 56% of the land mass in this country, uh, we serve most of the areas where we would be trying to secure these materials in terms of mining. So increased domestic production across the board for the various products you're talking about. Uh, electric co-ops are in those areas. We would be serving those uh, mines with electric service, and it's an area that we would value, of course, because it's part of the economic opportunity for rural communities. And since we're owned... Are, we're owned by the communities we serve. We're always interested in those economic opportunities. But I'm not to, I, don't, I don't want to diminish what you raise in terms of national security issues. Uh, greater domestic supply gives us greater opportunity to control the situation. I mentioned earlier to Senator Capito, the supply chain challenges we're facing in the electric sector are much more pronounced for the, for the, the electric utilities. They're more reliant on foreign supply. Mm. Uh, a number of our co-ops have domestic supply manufacturing relationships, and they still face supply chain challenges, but they're not as severe. So there's no question that uh, if we can uh, find production of these uh, minerals or anything else in the supply chain for electric cooperatives, a domestic source is uh, preferable. Yeah. Well, you know, that's so obvious to, to most people. Sen Senator Love. Sometimes have a difficult time uh, explaining why that's not the case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, I have uh, two unanimous consent requests. Uh, one to place uh, a, a resources for the future study that shows consumers will not be harmed by the methane emission reduction program. A second, a unanimous consent request to pl place some materials on the economic uh, impact of wasted energy from methane leakage into the record. If there's no objection. I just note for the record, we've de been developing a bipartisan basis in something called the Methane Emish Emission Reduction Program. And before uh, any uh, oil and gas companies required to pay a fee, uh, they would be offered uh, assistance up to like three quarters of a billion dollars of money uh, would be set aside to help uh, pay down the the costs for actions taken by oil and gas companies to reduce emissions before any fees would uh, would kick in. So there you go. All right. I think uh, next is Senator Whitehouse. Senator Whitehouse, please. Thank you, yeah. Chairman, and thank you to uh, all the witnesses for being here. This is going to be a lively discussion because we have dramatically differing views. Uh, on this committee as to what is actually going on here. I feel listening to much of what has been said, uh, like those um, advertisements that you sometimes see on TV where some old band is selling its CD of its greatest hits and all the old songs that you uh, are supposed to love, uh, they're selling you the CD package. And a lot of what we're hearing today sounds like the CD package of the oil and gas industries greatest hits, um, I think the fact of the matter is that sellers in a market economy, which is what we are, set price. And the price that the sellers have set is a very high price. Ordinarily, the market intervenes to put downward pressure on prices, but the market for oil and gas is peculiar because it is based on an international cartel 
that sets international prices and a bunch of international speculation, particularly driven by the conflict in Ukraine and the uncertainty in Russia. So there's an international price that is completely unhinged from cost. And we've all seen this slide that the president used that shows what has happened as the prices went up, up went the prices at the pump, and then per barrel prices dropped dramatically, and yet the industry kept its prices up. So this whole red zone is basically excess profit that is not related to a market economy. It is taking advantage of excess prices from an international cartel. And we have another graphic here that shows the same thing. Domestic oil production and the price of gasoline, there just isn't much of a, let me bring it down a little bit so the camera can see it there. There just isn't great correlation between the two. It's not very dynamically connected. So we have these, uh, this kind of oil cartel and a very small group of very big oil companies that are setting prices and reaping unbelievable profits. And what are they doing with those unbelievable profits? They're not turning them back to people at the pump. In fact, here's Darren Woods, the president and CEO of ExxonMobil, which is the biggest of the lot. And he's saying exactly what he's going to do. He's going to pay back his lenders. He's going to raise the dividend to his shareholders. And he's going to buy back shares, which boost share price and coincidentally his comp compensation. So none of it is going back to consumers. They're not even mentioned in this statement. But the industry PR machine is out full blast trying to blame this on people who don't have the power to set price. And it's a little hard to um, accept that, which is why I've proposed that the companies at least split that excess profit with consumers and send that money back to consumers' pockets for them to spend, if they want to spend it on more gasoline, great, they'll have money in their pockets to do that. If they want to spend it on food or pharmaceuticals or rent or whatever they want to spend it on, but share the windfall profits. Claw back some of the excess profit that reflects the disconnect between actual domestic production cost and these international cartel-driven, speculator-driven markets that the companies are riding along to pocket tens of billions of dollars. According to Exxon, they're spending $10 billion just on the share buyback part of this bonanza. So there is definitely money there that could be used to reduce costs for consumers. Mm -hmm. And they're definitely not interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. And they're definitely not in a real market because they're dealing with this international cartel, surfing on the cost, on the price, that is set by an international cartel full of not very great people, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia, you know, Venezuela, really thrilled that that's the group that's setting domestic prices off of which our oil companies run. And then that our oil companies, when they have that opportunity, don't dial it back to help consumers. They just pocket it. Good for shareholders, good for CEOs, good for stock price, not good for consumers. That's what we're dealing with. That's the short run problem. The long run problem is that here in Congress, we have been buffaloed by the oil and gas industry forever to create a completely unfair environment for renewable energy, so we remain hooked on oil and gas. If we had solved this problem a decade ago, we wouldn't have this vulnerability. If we'd solved it 20 years ago, we wouldn't have this vulnerability. If we had solved this 30 years ago, and Senator John Chafee of Rhode Island was holding hearings in this committee pointing out what was driving climate change and how difficult this was going to be, we wouldn't have this problem now. We are hostages to the oil and gas industry, which is now telling us that the solution for the hostages is to buy more oil and gas. What could be more expected? 
I yield back. Oh, I'm sorry. I went over. I yield nothing back. My apologies. <laughs> my apologies to my colleagues. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for those, for those comments, Sheldon. All right, next, uh, Senator Kramer, and then I, my notes here indicate Senator Stapanow, you'd follow Senator Kramer, and Senator Lemus, I think you're gonna follow Senator Stapanow. So, all right, Senator Kramer, for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you all for being here, uh, witnesses, and I just, I do have to respond a little bit, um, because Senator Whitehouse, I think is wrong, I, actually, I think it is dynamically connected. It's not statically connected. When he talks about price, at, 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 that a producer gets paid for producing oil and the price at the pump. It's quite dynamic, but it's not static. In fact, in, in a response to a question by, uh, uh, I think to you, to you, Ms. Skama, um, you referenced the oil export ban being lifted. I, I was, as I watched the markets today, and I see that WTI and Brent are roughly $3 apart, I remember before the ban, they were $30 apart. In other words, the United States has helped bring down the cost of oil globally, as opposed to being a price taker, we become a price maker. That's good for the world and that's enhanced um, productivity and it's, in, it's brought prices down. And frankly, if we do a lot more of it, we could be the price maker uh, yet again. And we have this window of opportunity. Never in my wildest dreams uh, uh, Congressman Matheson, in my wildest dreams, when I would see my dad come home from climbing poles for Cass County Rural Electric Cooperative, did I imagine I would be meeting on an almost daily basis with European energy leaders pleading with us to help them meet a demand that they have and they've cut themselves off of in Russia. We have a moment to do it cleaner, greener, better, by investing more in what we do really, really well. And I, while I appreciate the, the uh, illustration of, of uh, turning albums into CDs into digital music and celebrating the oldies, quite honestly, I don't want to be the leader of a new world order. I want to be the leader of a free world order. And that's what the oil and gas industry has provided us in this country and what we are able to provide the world today. If we stop the Listen, I'm all for long-term aspirational goals. We can have a 2050 fantasy. I don't mind that. But it's being met by a 2022 reality. And we ought to step up to that reality today and, in, and enhance the opportunity. So, uh, Mr. Matheson, with regard to your testimony about rural cooperatives yeah. and co-ops not having the commercially available technologies to, to have... Um, base load electricity generation and and have it all be carbon free. There are some opportunities and 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 Senator Cardin is right and Senator Whitehouse is right and Senator Carper is right. There is a lot of bipartisan support for some, you know, innovation and technological advancement um, incentives around here. We need to do more of that. So you know, Minn Kota Electric in, in North Dakota is on the very forefront of a commercially a, 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 a commercial opportunity for carbon capture utilization and storage technologies. Um, but you also, I'm sure, know that there are some challenges to that. Could you speak to that just a little bit in how we could maybe do more to, to provide opportunities to innovate? Sure, happy to do that. I appreciate the question. Look, it's a, a, foundationally, you have to have always available supply to maintain reliability 24-7. And I know I've said that a couple of times. <laughs> I can't say it enough. I agree with you. And so uh, we need to be thoughtful about how we talk about this in terms of a portfolio approach to all the sources of electricity generation in this country. And it's going to transition over time, but the portfolio has got to maintain reliability and affordability. And uh, you, you mentioned specifically the Minn Kota project. It's right. It's a commercial, commercial size carbon capture sequestration effort at a coal-fired power plant. It's an exciting opportunity. It represents a commitment by electric co-ops to try to be part of the solution. What can Congress do? Well, uh, there's this issue of Congress often uses tax credits to incentivize these things. And we are non-for-profit electric cooperatives, so we do not benefit directly from those tax credits. Uh, uh, I would suggest whether it's renewables, whether it's carbon capture, or whatever type of tax credit Congress wants to offer, um, we and the municipal utilities are on the outside looking in, quite frankly. Yes. So if Congress wants to incent investments in these emerging new technologies, uh, I would suggest you may want to create, say, create that incentive for everyone in the electric sector 
and it's called direct pay is the term we use. It's a very popular item. It's, it, 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 I know it went through the Senate Finance Committee and I marked up bill earlier this year, uh, excuse me, late last year. So I think there's an opportunity to help incent that investment in the electric co-op side as well. You asked for a question about what you could specifically do. That would be my number one ask. I, I'm with you. Thank you. Yeah. And I've got five seconds. So, Ms. Gama, um, real quickly, real quickly, what can what can we do to enjoy this incredible abundance of resources that we have in a way that's both clean, but also recognizes America's leadership? We produce it here. We produce it here more cleanly than any other country. Um, you know they more greenhouse gas emissions if you import it from overseas. So just produce it here. Well, I worry a lot about the signals being sent by the SEC this week, um, the Federal Reserve nominees and others. Uh, we, we can get into that if we do another round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, uh, Senator Sabinow. Senator Thank Sabinow. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This deserves a, a lot of debate. We have very, very different views on this. I have to say, coming from Michigan, that uh, 1914, there were all kinds of articles about Henry Ford and Thomas Edison who were uh, creating the, the first vehicles, and they wanted to do it with battery technology, and they had this debate about range, you know, and, but instead of their getting tax incentives to do that, two years later, the Congress of the United States, embedded in the tax code for over 100 years now, major uh, tax credits for oil and gas with no uh, connection to the pollution that it involves. So here we are today. Uh, we picked a winner uh, uh, yeah, 100, over 100 years ago. They won. Now we're trying to level the playing field as we tackle uh, the climate crisis because of, of carbon pollution. Um, I also just uh, want to indicate we are the largest oil producing country. Uh, in the last year, the top 25 largest oil companies made over $205 billion in profits in the United States, Mr. Chairman, uh, and yet our prices are going up at the pump. Our prices are going up, um, and it's interesting because the last time a barrel of oil was $96, gas was $3.62 a gallon at the pump. Last week, it was $96 again. This time, it was $4.31, not $3.62, $4.31. So it's, you know, this is about what the market will bear, right? It's, it's really about, in my judgment, there is, there is price gouging um, going on. And we, we have 9,000 approved leases that we aren't using. So if, in fact, supply production does relate to prices, let's use the leases. Let's, let's produce more. But I, what I really want to talk about is where we go from here and how we can both uh, support the biofuels uh, that will get us to a cleaner uh, uh, future and electric vehicles so you can drive by the pump and not worry about what the sign says. So um, I first have to ask, though, I know that in your testimony, Ms. Segment, you talked about the fact that electric vehicles won't work because we don't have the critical minerals, we don't have the... Uh, you know, the capacity to, to do this. Um, and certainly this is a, a challenge we're aware of, but we have our companies that have um, uh, weighed in, the iconic Ford Motor Company, uh, General Motors, Mary Barr, who's now the president of the business uh, roundtable, chair of the business roundtable, saying by 2035 that they're only gonna produce uh, electric vehicles. That's what GM is saying, Ford is all in. Do you think they're uninformed? Well, I don't think you've characterized what I said in my testimony correctly. I don't say they don't work, but I said that a realistic um, approach is to recognize that the increased use of natural gas in the electricity sector has already been the equivalent of 190 EVs on the road. So we have delivered the same reduction as would 190 million electric vehicles. Now, there are 11 million electric vehicles globally today and projections that we could get to maybe 145 million by 2030. So, so you're saying that uh, natural gas is more clean, is cleaner than zero emission electric vehicles? Um, I'm just saying that natural gas has already delivered the equivalent reduction since 2005 okay. of 190 million vehicle EVs right. on the road. Well, it, I think it is important to, um, because I hear this all the time, opponents of electric vehicles saying that electrifying our uh, vehicle fleet will result in us being dependent on China for batteries and rare earth materials. And that certainly is something we need to focus on, which is why we need a whole range of 
uh, uh, tax credits and strategies to make sure we're bringing those jobs home and supporting uh, people in the vehicle industry that are pretty smart. They wouldn't bet the farm. They wouldn't bet the whole company if they didn't think that they would be able uh, to get there. So I want to just ask, um, I could go through, and I'm going to run out of time, and go through everything we've already invested, what we need to do, but Ms. Stinken, could you, uh, do you agree that a suite of policies and incentives are needed for the U.S. to remain the leader in electric vehicles, and should we be doing that? Testing. All right. Yes, absolutely. I, I fully support our transition to electric vehicles and the bipartisan infrastructure law laid that perfect foundation for that. And now it's time to build on top of that for a whole of nation approach. And just to add on to the critical minerals piece here, I mean, geologically speaking, China does not have all of the resources or the reserves of critical minerals. The U.S., we actually have a very robust share ourselves and our allies. And so together with bold policy support, the United States and our allies, we can extract in a, an environmentally safe way. Uh, we can process the minerals and make the batteries to meet the demand. I absolutely agree. We can do it in America. We just need to be bold and focused and invest absolutely. in America. Mm -hmm. and, um, and just one other quick thing, Secretary Mabus, um, how would seeding the clean energy manufacturing sector to China harm U.S. economic and national security? I think it harms it in so many ways. Um, our military is dependent on so many of these technologies. And if we don't have the capacity to make them here at home, we don't have the capacity to do the research and development here at home, we're gonna raise the risk to our national security pretty dramatically. And as you pointed out, we have the, uh, the ability to do this. We've got the minerals. What we've lacked are the, are the incentives, are the policies to make sure that we keep those, those manufacturing jobs, the manufacture of those batteries and the precursor materials here in the United States. And I, I think that's incredibly important to our national security. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Stabenow. Uh, Senator Lummis is next and uh, joining us right after uh, uh, Senator Lemus will be Senator Duckworth, who's going to join us by WebEx, and then uh, a colonel from, Marine colonel from Alaska will follow that. All right, Senator Lemus, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to say how nice it is to see my former colleague from the House, Jim Matheson. Great to see you. Um, and thank you uh, for holding this hearing today, and Ranking Member Capito, thank you for doing this as well. Um, one area that I hope to find agreement on this subject is uh, unleashing nuclear energy in America. Uh, and so my first question uh, is for Mr. Mabus. Um, in your testimony, you advocate for prohibiting oil and gas imports from Russia as a means to cut off Russian revenues. And isn't the same true um, restricting Russian uranium, which also provides direct revenues to the Russian government? I think cutting off all Russian energy you know, revenues is incredibly important. And coming from the Navy, where we um, have used nuclear for propulsion from um, the mid-50s till today with safely with no accidents, I do think that nuclear, um, particularly some of the new technologies of small modular reactors, yeah. need to be a part of the mix. Thank you. Um, and, and I would note um, the, the last uh, questioner mentioned how uh, incentives were needed, tax incentives. Uh, I would argue that regulatory relief uh, is the more uh, important place to look, especially when it comes to rare earth minerals and uh, uranium. Uh, these are the products that are held up and stymied in the United States, including in my home state of Wyoming, uh, because the, it's the regulatory burden and the length of time and the cost to get through all those regulatory hurdles uh, that um, s snuffs out the financial capability and wherewithal for these companies to move forward and develop these rare earth minerals and uranium in the United States. So uh, let's, let's address the regulatory side of it. 
uh, as well. Uh, Ms. Sagama, um, my colleague here from North Dakota and I both sit on the banking committee. Uh, we're aware that um, the Federal Reserve nominee that was uh, rejected on a bipartisan basis uh, was advocating uh, limiting credit access to energy companies, and, and her writings were genuinely hostile uh, to the energy industry. So in light of the fact that this became an issue um, that uh, ultimately uh, caused her to uh, not be accepted, uh, do you think it's appropriate for the SEC to be issuing a climate proposal? SEC simply doesn't have the authority to regulate climate change. I mean, Congress hasn't even passed a law. Why should a, an agency just assume that, um, assume that regulatory power? And, you know, we'll note that ESG, uh, as uh, BlackRock uh, has uh, asserted, because of its market power, its ESG uh, portfolio demands are really driving the market in that direction anyway. Government doesn't need to do that. Um, again, Ms. Sagama, uh, could you expand on the greenhouse gas reduction efforts and outcomes by the oil and gas industry that you detail in testimony? Well, I'd like to highlight the fact that in the electricity sector, uh, fuel switching to natural gas has reduced more greenhouse gas emissions than wind and solar combined. Um, we've reduced about 3.5 billion t metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions uh, compared to 2.1 uh, billion by renewables. And we did that without incentives. We did that without um, subsidies. We did that through market investment from private sector investment and just increased use of natural gas or increased production of natural gas. Natural gas, especially in this country, is so incredibly clean uh, that I'm actually surprised that uh, climate advocates uh, don't highlight the benefits of natural gas uh, in their um, agendas. Um, because climate change is climate-based and, and globally-based, um, I would argue that the cost uh, and benefits associated with helping countries like India with their... Uh, greenhouse gas emissions by helping them switch to natural gas or LNG would f globally be enormous, so much bigger than what we could produce here in the United States in terms of greenhouse gas reductions. My gosh, helping India do the same thing with the same amount of money that takes us to get little tiny incremental benefits, if we would help them with that amount of money, we could have huge Huge incremental benefits for the global climate. Excuse me. Uh, my time is run out. <laughs> I, I yield back. <laughs> no, you can't yield back. You have nothing to yield. <laughs> the staff just handed me a note. It says, natural gas fracking enjoyed a production tax credit for 20 years from the 1980s to the early uh, 2000s. So just for, for the record. Okay. Let's see who's next. Uh, and... Senator Markey, somehow you slip ahead of these folks. I'm, I'm not sure how you did that, but uh, you're next. No, thank you so much. Um, and again, you know, if the oil and gas and coal industry have a tax break for 100 years, all we're looking for is a little equal treatment, you know, so that we have the same kind of predictability for 100 years. Um, I think we'd feel really good about, you know, our future in renewable industry, and they call that for renewables socialism, if that's yeah. what you call it, then give us whatever the oil, gas, and coal industry had for 100 years in terms of their protections, and we'll be very happy with that in terms of the, the protections. So if we're going to break our dependence upon Putin's dirty energy oil, um, we, the, the oil companies have had years to live up to their promises of affordability and security, but they weren't just selling oil, they were selling snake oil to American consumers. Take their argument, for example, that lifting the export ban would help American energy independence. In 2014, the year before Congress lifted the ban, 
on exports, 9 million barrels a day were imported from other countries. Today, believe it or not, the United States now exports 8.6 million barrels of oil a day. We export it out of our own country. 8.6 million barrels. That, that wasn't really what the promise was of the oil industry in 2015 when we lifted that ban. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, we, we can see increasingly that American consumers are exposed to the global price fluctuation caused by Putin and Chinese energy demands and other external forces. Uh, so, Secretary Mabus, uh, first I'd like to thank you for your great service to our country uh, as the U.S. remains attached to global oil markets and dependent on oil and natural gas as a result of big oil's business decisions. Do you agree that we are running a constant risk of, pay, uh, of playing into petrostates and undermining our security and that of our allies in addition to fueling instability from climate change? Absolutely, on both counts, Senator. The, the fact that we allow these uh, tyrants and dictators like Putin to basically hold our families and our economy hostage for their, for their bad acts and that we are not addressing climate change nearly as strongly as we should in order to prevent some of the really terrible things that uh, you're already beginning to see happen. And so I think both the things you said are absolutely true. No, thank you. And by the way, it's great to see my old friend Jim Matheson here. Um, just, um, just a great congressman, my great friend. So here's where we are. We have, uh, uh, we have right now um, 6,000 leases that, the, um, uh, that uh, have been bid for by the oil industry on onshore public lands. It's about two bucks a barrel. They are not drilling on those right now. There's 3,000 um, leases offshore at about two bucks an acre. They're not drilling on that as well. But let's just go even further. They have 6,000 leases that they're already drilling on that they've just stopped drilling on. That are already about half drilled. They're not drilling on that either. So I just keep hearing drill baby drill, but the reality is that um, if we want to get real and move to our greatest strength in our country, it's got to be plug in, baby, plug in. Uh, because for every 16 million all electric vehicles which we deploy in the United States, we back out all the oil that we import from uh, Russia. So that's just the reality. In the next 16 million barrels, I mean, the next 16 million all electric vehicles, we back out the Saudi oil, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why the tax breaks for all electric vehicles, for batteries, are so important. Uh, because we can tell Russia we don't need their oil any more than we need their caviar. We can tell Saudi Arabia we don't need their oil any more than we need their sand. We can do it, but we have to unleash this incredible revolution. And that's all in the legislation. It's still pending. You know, that we take this as our moment, our signal to be able to move to the future. So um, EV is electric vehicle, but it can also stand for av avoiding, evading violence, you know, getting ourselves into wars around the world, funding uh, despots, autocracies, uh, where it's completely avoidable because we put 70% of the oil we consume into gasoline tanks, uh, and it's something that we can cure ourselves of and also reduce greenhouse gases, and also protect consumers from crazy price spikes the way we uh, see right now. So uh, the, Na the National Climate Bank that came out of this committee, that's part of the solution. Uh, so on so many of the other programs that, uh, that we have been considering in this committee and are all ready to be passed. Uh, but if we're going to be serious, um, we have to do everything we can to uh, pass those tax breaks pass the Climate Bank, uh, and send a message to these countries around the world that finally America as a technological giant is going to rise up because right now we have oil companies sitting on 15,000 leases that they're not drilling on because they're saying they're not making enough money. Uh, and that just can't be 
how we protect American security, the American economy, the environment of our country, uh, and ultimately our moral standing in the world. If we have a capacity to do this, we should unleash that revolution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Markey, thank you. Senator Sullivan, you're next, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And of course, uh, it's always good to hear from my <laughs> friend from Massachusetts. I don't. We thought it'd be nice to pair the two of you. I don't have side to agree with him on a lot of these issues. Um, just a reminder: the administration put a moratorium on any oil and gas leasing, and by the way, any permits to drill—that's a more detailed th uh, uh, requirement. They're still sitting on 4,621 permit to drill applications that they've stopped. So we have a lot of difference on this. But here's an area where Senator Markey and I probably agree. He talked about a revolution. He talked about greenhouse gas emissions. Let's get that up there. OK, I, I want to talk about this chart for quite some time, because it never, it never gets the uh, attention that it deserves. So uh, right here, this shows that's from 2005 to 2020. The United States uh, dropped its emissions of CO2 emissions by 970 million metric tons, okay? So do all the, uh, well, let's start with you, Ms. Uh, Sagma and Mr. Matheson. That's a pretty remarkable record, isn't it? Look at relative to China, relative to India, relative to any major economy in the world, since 2005, the United States has reduced greenhouse gas emissions by almost 15%, best in the world, isn't that correct? For almost two decades, correct? Everybody agree with that? I mean, those are the facts. How did that happen? Increased <clears throat> use of natural gas is the primary reason. Correct. It was the revolution. The shale in, revolution, yep. In natural gas. So. Had every other country in the world had a record like the, this, where do you think we'd be on global emissions? Again, panelists, you guys can all jump in. These are facts. Nobody ever talks about them because they're inconvenient truths, as Al, Gro uh, Al whatever the, Gore, thank you. I was thinking about someone else, but that's a whole other story. Um, Mr. Matheson, do you want to comment on this? Look, I think, I think from the electric cooperative perspective, yeah, we've seen a reduction in emissions. I mentioned it in my testimony, uh, primarily driven by switch to increase use of natural gas. Uh, we also have had... Uh, but I mean, this is astounding, isn't it? I mean, we're the leader in the world by far, correct? Yeah, the, yeah, the chart says it. Yeah. yeah. And China, of course, and India are going through the roof, correct? So... My question always is to the Biden administration, why would you stop that? Because right now, I mean, just look at the FERC's latest ruling. Look at, they all seem to be focused on shutting down the production of oil and gas. What, if this is the record right now, do you think it makes sense, Ms. Sagma, to, to shut down the production of natural gas in America or make it harder to produce like the FERC's latest rule just did? It does not. If we really wanted to provide meaningful solutions to climate change, we would look at increasing our exports of natural gas to the world so that they could deliver the same type of greenhouse gas. So reductions. that's a great segue. Thank you. You know, Senator Lummis, Senator Kramer and I, we put forward this plan several months ago, worked on it for many months. It's our American Energy Jobs and Climate Plan. And it would do more than almost anything because it focuses on that. Let me give you an estimate. We, we ran some numbers. If the United States significantly increased exports of a clean-burning American natural gas globally to India, we already export to India, we already export to China, what do you think the global emission reductions would be? I'll just, do you have a ballpark figure, I can give it to you. I don't have a ballpark figure, but they would go down. But the problem is, like, we can't build pipelines so that we can supply our LNG export terminals. It, and, yeah. The answer is about 9% globally. 9%, which is remarkable. That's, that's um, modeling that we did as part of the, our plan. And it's based not on some pie-in-the-sky... Um, predictions that John Kerry and others make when they go around the world telling countries not to buy American natural gas. Can you believe that? 
That's what he does, which is to me remarkable, almost un-American. But how could we get to this? What are your recommendations where we can take what we're doing in America, and it, could you imagine if the rest of the world did what we're doing, what greenhouse gas emissions globally would do? They would dramatically drop. It would empower America in terms of our jobs, in terms of our energy, in terms of lower greenhouse gas emissions here and abroad. What more can we do to make that a reality besides adopting the Sullivan, Kramer, Lummis plan, which we know that you're all very enthusiastically supporting? Right. I, th I think, and I, I know it's things you've addressed as well, is we need to um, stop the overregulation of the industry. Um, and of course, we're heavily regulated, and we should be, but it's the additional regulations that they continue to pile on that are meant to get to an answer of no when it comes to natural gas projects. Move forward with the infrastructure, the pipelines, LNG terminals, so that we can export that same greenhouse gas reduction to the rest of the world. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I would welcome the chance to have a hearing on our plan. We think uh, it's very, it would be very bipartisan. Many of the issues discussed here today um, are in the plan, and it would have an impact like this. And who can argue with this? Who can argue with this? I don't even think my friend Ed Markey can argue with this. That is a real... That's real success, and we need to continue it, not try to curtail it or shut it down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chair, if I could just add one more thing Please. to that. Well, I'd like to say, I mean, that from 2005 to 2020, I mean, I personally was working in the solar industry at that time, and that's when we saw the great advent of the renewable energy industry, solar coming online, wind coming online. So those reductions from the United States are all due to great policies that we adopted here to advance renewable energy. But those not as much as natural with, gas. With all due respect, those reductions that I'm showing right there almost have zero to do with renewables. I'm an all the above uh, policy um, promoter in terms of energy, but that chart is due to the revolution in natural gas, and if you're claiming otherwise, you don't know what the facts are. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Stan, you want to finish your, your comment? I just say in terms of China here, I mean, I think we need to be really aware of the Made in China 2025 strategy there, which is advancing them towards transportation electrification. They have their own policies there that want to get off oil for the same reasons that we're seeing here because of the price spikes and the volatility there. They want to be, uh, you know, advancing in electric vehicles because of the critical minerals processing that they control right now. And they want to be looking towards adopting autonomous vehicles and 5G technology, which is the future of a lot of different um, facets of their economy. And so I think we need to really keep an eye on China and what they're doing. And if they're moving forward aggressively with transportation electrification, then we need to do the same. All right. Thanks so much. And uh, I think Senator Duckworth is trying to join us uh, by WebEx. Senator Duckworth, are you uh, out there? I sure am, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. I'm so glad we're having this hearing. Thank yeah, me you. Too. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I just want to just start off by uh, talking a little bit about oil and the, and the global economy. You know, uh, the narrative that one individual in one country can control the global oil economy is a false narrative. Additionally, the narrative that more leases would decrease today's gas prices and immediately help secure energy independence from Russia is also a false narrative. There are almost 9,000 leases on federal lands right now that go unused every year, um, and new leases take three to 10 years to get online to start contributing to the global market with little comprehensive effect. And in fact, there are 3,000 leases uh, where the oil companies had started drilling, have all the permits, have all the approvals, and they simply have stopped drilling uh, because that was a business decision they made. Um, and, you know, for example, uh, if Keystone Pipeline, if operable today, would only impact our global production by less than 1%. The United States is the largest producer of oil and natural gas and will produce more oil than ever before by 2023. So the ability to produce is not a problem. The oil markets work like works like most markets, it's impacted by supply, demand, and market speculation on futures prices. Recovering from a global pandemic coupled with the Ukraine crisis are naturally going to have an impact on our oil futures. We can't control that. However, one of the major contributors to the oil market that we do control is production or supply. Selling uh, SPR is helpful, but without supply to meet the demand, prices will rise. That's simple economics. Unfortunately, big oil controls production, and these private businesses are choosing to spend their capital elsewhere. This attitude of using their funds to pay high dividends rather than increasing production of oil 
is incredibly upsetting. They could increase production, start drilling again in those 3,000 leases that they already have permission and have already begun production on, but they choose not to. You know, we had big oils back when disaster hit, and it's time now for them to repay taxpayers with an increase in supply, which is very much within their control. Taking advantage of a global crisis to the financial benefit of an industry is immoral behavior. It reminds me of some oil companies actions immediately following Hurricane Katrina, where they hiked up rates while people were drowning. Excessively increasing oil prices and reasonably decreasing or halting supply to increase your profit margins is shameful and unreasonably, sorry, unreasonably decreasing or halting supply to increase your profit margins is shameful. That's why I am introducing the Gas Price Gouging Prevention Act, ma making it a federal crime during a period of an international crisis affecting the oil markets to sell oil at a price that is unconscionably excessive and indicates the seller is taking unfair advantage of the circumstances related to an international crisis to increase prices unreasonably. Protecting hardworking American families from corporate greed, in my view, should be a bipartisan goal, as I hope this bill will be. Of course, the legislative process can be difficult and lengthy. We all know that. And we must also push the federal government to exhaust all existing authority to crack down on greedy price gouging practices. That's why I called on President Biden to direct Attorney General Mer Merrick Garland to establish a gasoline price gouging enforcement task force to carefully monitor and investigate oil and gas markets potential for potential violations of criminal or civil laws, including gasoline price gouging. These actions will signify that Congress will not sit idly by and allow any corporation to abuse their power by unfairly taking money from hardworking Americans' families. Saving families money at the pump is also why I joined forces with my Republican colleague, Senator Ernst, to introduce the Home Front Energy Independence Act that will incentivize biofuel production and allow for the year-round sale of E15 fuel. This will give families a significantly cheaper fuel option at the pump, saving more than 50 cents per gallon which leads finally to my first question. Secretary Mavis, I have been a huge fan of yours over the years. Um, and I think that if we've learned anything from the market these last few years, it is that we must lower our dependence on fossil fuels and shift to renewable energy. Because if we remain fully and solely dependent on the oil market, we will continue to have an erratic future. While you were Secretary of the Navy, part of your admirable goal to decrease the Navy's petroleum consumption was the use of ethanol blends and E15. As gas prices continue to increase and American families are left paying unbelievable prices at the pump, do you think, Secretary Mavis, that having E15 fuel as a choice during the coming summer months will be a helpful alternative to combat high gas prices and reduce petroleum production? Senator, I think in the, in the near future, that is one way we can reduce uh, what people are paying at the pump. And in the, uh, you're right, we, we went to flex fuel vehicles, we went to agricultural biomass, uh, which is what, what these things come out of. And as you uh, look to the future, um, when you get to second generation biofuels, um, you're gonna be able to use the corn stalks, the stover, the wheat stalks um, to, to do fuel so that you can sell the corn or the wheat for one thing, you can sell the stover for, for energy and it will not only lower the price of the pump, but it will give American farmers a whole new energy stream, which, uh, which a lot of them desperately need. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks so much for joining us, Senator Duckworth, uh, uh, by WebEx. And uh, second round for Senator Markey, and then we're going to have to wrap up. I, I need to leave fairly soon. Okay, but beautiful. Go, right, go right ahead, please. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, so again, I just want to come back to the point that I had made earlier, which is that um, there are 9,000 leases on federal lands, offshore and onshore, that the um, oil and gas industry have already won and purchased. And if they wanted to drill, they should have been drilling. Of course, they didn't. Um, but to come in then and say they need more leases when they haven't even used the ones that they've already purchased from us, well, you know, that would be foolish on the part of the American taxpayer um, because they should either lose it, use it, or lose it. Use the ones you have or lose them. Give them back to us, okay, before you start asking for more. 
leases that you are going to be using. And again, there's 6,000 uh, other uh, partially drilled um, um, f uh, uh, operations all around the country that they've just stopped. They're already permitted, those 6,000. They're not drilling on them right now either. So just show us some good faith and start drilling there. You already got the permits. Just if you really care about it, st stop asking for more when you haven't even used what you've already got, especially the ones that are already um, half drilled, already um, partially drilled. Get to work. Get us that oil and gas. But don't say we're stopping you. We're, we, the, the Democrats on this committee are not stopping you. Go and do it anytime you want. And, uh, and again, when it, when it comes to um, uh, the um, renewable revolution, which we keep hearing uh, is, uh, is not the answer, well, here's the good news. Renewables are cheaper, and their prices are stable, and we actually can't say the same thing about oil and gas that we can say in, say in terms of the, the pricing. And 90% uh, of electricity waiting to be connected in the United States is renewables. Can I say that again? 90% of all electricity waiting to be connected in our country is renewables right now. So uh, if I may, because I can see you have a superior educational background at Boston College, um, <laughs> Ms. Stankin, uh, could you comment on that? Am I accurate in my analysis? Yes, Boston College, a great university. Go, go Eagles. <laughs> I appreciate your accent too, but it takes me right back. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, renewables, they're ready to be connected to the grid right now, and that's going to power our electric transportation future. And I'd just like to point out too, you were talking about the level playing field. Well, the United States spends annually $80 billion defending our, our oil investments. And China right now has invested $60 billion over the past decade for their transportation electrification future. So we've got you know $80 billion in one year here, and 60 billion over the decade that China's has been doing to take the commanding lead with transportation electrification. I mean, let's let's talk uh, about the, the level playing field. So what you're saying is, when you're deploying wind and solar here in the United States, we actually don't need the United States military deployed as they are in the Middle East to make sure that those tankers can come. Over. That's exactly what I'm but, saying. Absolutely. And that doesn't fully get factored in at all, or it doesn't get factored in at all. Mm -hmm. They want to pretend as though that's just some, like greenhouse gases are an externality. They really shouldn't be counted. So too is the military budget of our mm -hmm. country. So much of it disproportionately targeted towards the Middle East, where coincidentally the oil uh, that uh, we import is coming from. So, uh, so can you expand upon that just a little bit more? Sure, yeah. I mean, the electricity that's powering electric vehicles, um, that is being generated domestically here in the United States. It is cleaner, it is safer, it is uh, more reliable here. Um, we're creating great, excellent jobs here by expanding the, you know, as Jim could say too, by expanding our electric generation here. And there was actually a report done by the Department of Energy in 2019 that showed that annually we are putting on about an additional 12 gigawatts of electricity generation onto the grid that can more than meet the demand of the electric vehicles coming on. No, and I agree with you 100%. Uh, we now actually generate 200,000 megawatts of renewables a year in the United States. Back in 2009, when Joe Biden and Barack Obama were being sworn in, it was 2,000 megawatts of solar total mm -hmm. in history and 25,000 megawatts of wind. Now we're up to 200,000. So it wasn't as though all of a sudden it got windier or sunnier. It's just that we got a lot of those um, obstacles at the state and federal level out of the way. And there's still more work to be done, but it includes um, ensuring that we're incentivizing transmission lines so we can get it uh, to, from where it's being generated, wind and solar, to where it's needed, and that we also pass those tax breaks for the generation of wind and solar onshore and offshore. And I will add that we also passed the bill uh, that is still pending, President Biden's bill, uh, for about $40 billion worth of tax breaks to to actually manufacture the wind and solar here in the United States. Um, that's critical as well, so that we can just say made in America uh, for wind and solar as it comes down and we capture it, and then the workers uh, actually manufacture all the technologies that accomplish that goal. So it's all there, uh, and nothing, and it has nothing to do with any longer with Russia 
or with the Middle East. You know, we are energy independent if we do that. But of course, that's going to be blocked. And who will be blocking it? Who will be trying to stop it? It will be the oil and gas and coal industry because they know that if we get the same subsidies, the same opportunities that the other industries did, uh, that uh, we will see this technological revolution unfold. So I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, very much for the opportunity to have a second round, and uh, I yield back. You bet. Thank you so much for joining us for a second round. I, um, I'm going to, you know, in baseball, baseball is about to get started. We're, folks are showing up for spring training. We're going to start playing real games in a couple of weeks. Uh, a pitcher, uh, say you have a, a term in baseball, or when a pitcher telegraphs his or her pitch. And, uh, and uh, what it means is that there's something, the way they hold the ball, the way they wind up, release the ball, tells you whether or not they're throwing a split finger fastball, a curve ball, a, sl a slider, whatever. I'm going to telegraph my pitch. And uh, um, the last question I'm going to ask of this panel, including the Secretary Mavis, is uh, where's some consensus? Where, is, where do you think there is agreement? One of the things this committee is very good at, when if you look at the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure bill, roads, highways, bridges, transportation infrastructures, we've reported out of this committee unanimously. Uh, water, wastewater, sanitation, flood control, we reported out of this committee a year ago unanimously. So we, uh, my, my sense there's a fair amount of consensus here. We may not have recognized it all during the course of this hearing, but there is consensus. So that's thing I'm going to ask is to come back to that. I have a couple other questions I'm going to ask, but I wanted to while you think about telegraphing that pitch. Think about what you might want to say in response, okay? All right. Um, uh, this uh, first question is uh, a question from Stankin, and uh, it uh, deals with short-term solutions. Um, I think all of us uh, know and realize uh, that uh, many Americans are hurting right now. Uh, they're feeling uh, pain at the gas pump uh, when they fill up. They are paying higher energy uh, home home energy prices, and it's uh, it's only right uh, that we dis discuss long term solutions to this situation in order to prevent it from from happening again and to improve our nation's energy outlook for the long run. However, it's also important that we explore short term solutions that could provide more immediate relief for consumers who are struggling right now under the burden of unpredictable costs. costs. And the, quite my question, Ms. Dankin, is would you please take a minute for us to discuss any short-term solutions you think might encourage us as lawmakers to consider as we look to address the crises that our, our uh, country is facing? Please. Happy to answer that. And um, I mentioned some of this in my testimony there, but just to elaborate on that, I mean, we really do need a, a sweet, a robust set of policies that complements what was done in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Those are the foundational policies, but we need to invest further than in the vehicle purchase incentives, things for building further out with the EV charging infrastructure, electrifying the federal fleet there, and then also providing a robust set of incentives focused on the manufacturing and ensuring that that is done here in the United States um, and also with our critical minerals. Okay, thank you. Uh, Secretary, uh, Sec this is be a, a question for Secretary Mabison, and I think maybe also for you, uh, Ms. Stanton. But uh, the question is, uh, how important is it for the United States government, including individual agencies such as the Postal Service, um, General Services Administration, uh, and the Department of Defense, how important is it for entities like that to, uh, to lead the, in the fight against climate change and support a, uh, an expeditious trans, uh, transition to a, a cleaner economy. So that's the first part of the question. And in your view, this is for Secretary Mavis, in your views, uh, can U.S. Uh, businesses, states, and local governments trans help to transition our economy without the assistance from the federal government? Two questions. Se Secretary Mavis, would you take those, please? I will, I will concentrate on your first question with DOD. Okay. DOD absolutely has to take the lead. They're the largest users of fossil fuels on earth. They can bring a market. They can accelerate this change exponentially. And it will help our national security. It will um, help us in terms of uh, making us better war fighters and making us more more secure um the um dod has always led in technological revolutions i mean you look at the internet 
you look at GPS, you look at flat screen TVs. Uh, those, those all came out of defense. And this is one place, and Secretary Austin says that there is nothing that defense does that is not impacted by climate change. And to, to answer your second question, I think the states and local governments are doing a lot right now, but they don't have the scope, they don't have the scale that the federal government does. And the federal government can, can accelerate this so much by policies and by the things that we incentivize. This is going to happen. It's very clear. We've passed the tipping point in terms of moving to renewables. It's a question now of how fast we're going to go and how well we're going to do it. And I think that you have to have the federal government uh, taking the lead in that, and particularly DOD, in order to, in order to succeed. Great, thank you for that. Uh, again, Stan, same two questions. I'm going to repeat the two questions just for clarification here. Uh, how important is it uh, for the U.S. government, including individual agencies like Department of Defense, General Services Administration, Department of Defense, to lead in the fight against climate change and to support an expeditious transition to a cleaner economy? That's the first question. Go ahead and answer that, and then I'll give you the second one. Great. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely critical that the federal government leads by example in this. And the Electrification Coalition, we are huge supporters of electrifying the federal fleet. They are, um, as Secretary Mabus was pointing out, um, they're the largest single fleet uh, operator here. The U.S. Postal Service alone has 190,000 vehicles within their fleet. And I can certainly elaborate more on the U.S. Postal Service um, and them going electric there. But, you know, uh, this, is, this represents significant savings to the American taxpayer by going electric. The electric vehicles we save you know, 50% on the maintenance costs compared to an internal combustion engine. And same thing with, with the fuel savings there. That is significant. Um, studies have shown, you know, that we're talking in the billions in terms of the savings here. And that was when gas prices were at $250 a gallon. And now that they're up at $4, $5, we're talking significant, significantly more savings. Yeah, thanks. And the second uh, question, again, and in your, in your view, can U.S. Uh, businesses, states, local government transition our economy without the assistance from the federal government? Yeah, well, we've been without um, leadership from the federal government um, prior to this administration. And so, you know, states have moved forward with um, doing what they can and advancing the right policies and, and putting forward adoption uh, or putting forward significant investments in this sector. But we would definitely need the support of the federal government here to be at the right scale that we need. Yeah, but we're going, uh, I'm not going to uh, dwell on the Postal Service. I just offer this. Roughly 200,000 vehicles in the Postal Fleet, maybe the largest fleet of vehicles in the country. Uh, today, they're almost all gas and diesel. And, um, and if there's some places in the country where, frankly, that makes sense. There's vast expansions in this country where a lot of, uh, there aren't a lot of people living, and the Postal Service still has an obligation to deliver to every mailbox six days a week. So and in some cases, it, it makes sense to have uh, fuel, uh, liquid fuel vehicles for, for, for maybe a good long while. A lot of places, that doesn't make much sense. And if we, I think if we, uh, I fear if we don't um, Take it a time when the, the Postal Service, whose fleet of almost 200,000 vehicles is about 25 years of age. If we don't use this as an opportunity to upgrade and move into the future, we'll relive to, to regret it. And if, when you look at what they're doing in FedEx, when you look at what they're doing in UPS, when they look at see what Amazon is doing uh, in terms of um, moving to more energy efficient, clean burning, uh, no, low or no emissions, it's, this is a time for us to, to act. Um, last uh, question I would ask of, of uh, uh, one of you, just one of you, I'm then going to ask a question for all of you that I telegraph, but this is for our, our Congressman Matheson. How, uh, and this deals with support for electric uh, cooperative transition. Uh, the Postal Service, is, is there, if I didn't say this, I said, is the Postal Service uh, uh, makes the transition from gas and diesel to more energy efficient, low emission vehicles. The federal government has an obligation to help write down the cost of those vehicles, help the Postal Service. We have an obligation to help in the fueling stations, if it's hydrogen, or the charging stations as well. So it's not all in the Postal Service. OK. Congressman Matheson, how necessary is federal government support to help the electric cooperative uh, transition from older and efficient uh, power plants to cleaner, efficient energy generation? Appreciate the question. Uh, I, 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 would, I would say, first of all, um, we've been making investments all along in our plants, so I, I, I would suggest that we've been making inv investments in efficiency. Uh, uh, and, and so I would not necessarily describe the whole fleet of generating assets owned by co-ops as, as particularly old or inefficient. 
But that being said, I do think that there are a couple of things the federal government can do that would be helpful. Uh, one, you've heard me say two or three times, and that is the, uh, the, the direct pay provision in terms of the tax credits that have been provided to the rest of the electric utility sector for a long time now, at the federal level for investing in new energy technologies, uh, renewables, production tax credit for nuclear, uh, uh, tax credit for carbon capture sequestration, uh, we don't get the benefit of that. And so the way it works is, is if we want to be involved in, let's say, a solar plant, a third party builds the solar plant, they take the tax credit, they take a profit, they sell the output to us. That works, and we have those relationships, but in terms of the value of that federal government support going to the consumer at the end of the line, that doesn't happen because there's that third party in the middle of that transaction. So I think you would see a significant increased investment out of electric cooperatives when the direct pay provision goes through. And I know you're familiar with it. You've been active on it. And I don't want to sound like a one-trick pony, but that really is something that's right in front of us here that Congress could do that would really help in terms of electric cooperative investment in this energy transition. I think it's the most important thing I can emphasize. The second thing I want to mention, though, and it's been talked a lot about electrification, is that as we move to a more electrified economy in the future, which I believe we are going to do, um, the delivery of that electricity, and I'm not a transmission engineer, but the delivery of that electricity creates new challenges for the grid. So we need to be thoughtful about looking for how we make sure the grid can meet this need to charge a whole bunch of electric vehicles where consumers may want rapid charging. That, that creates some, uh, they're technologically feasible, don't get me wrong, but that creates a new set of operating dynamics that we need to think about what investments do we need to make in the grid to meet those needs? I find that a great opportunity to have conversation where there may be a federal role uh, with advice from the labs, quite frankly, because it's a huge resource the federal government has at its disposal. That could be an area where we should have a conversation about grid modernization to meet this more electrified economy of the future. All right, great, thank you. I like to quote Einstein who said, among other things, in adversity lies opportunity. There's actually, uh, when I talk to the elect uh, utilities around the country, they uh, talk about where their growth is, is going to be for selling electricity, and most of them point to mo mobile, mobile, the mobile fleet. Okay. Um, now the, the pitch well telegraphed. The, uh, I'm going to go to uh, Secretary Mavis first on this, and then uh, Ms. Gama will uh, ask you, and, and then our Congressman, and, and then Ms. Stankin. Um, the question is, uh, as we've gone through it in a couple hours now, and it's, if you do, some people listen to it and say, well, they don't agree on anything. Well, I, actually, I think there is uh, quite, quite a bit of consensus on, on, on a lot of what we've talked about here. And I'm just going to ask you if, uh, if uh, uh, Secretary, maybe she could lead us off and say, where do you think some of the, uh, some of the, uh, that consensus might be and, and where might it lead us, please? You're, you're first. And Senator, thank you again for allowing me to testify. I think we've got some real agreement and it's important that climate change is real and that we have to, have to reduce emissions. That's one message that has come out of this hearing loud and clear that everybody agrees on. Secondly, that the solutions going forward have to be domestically based, that we can allow ourselves to be, um, to be held hostage by uh, international events. And finally, that we need to take immediate steps to ease the pain for consumers at the gas pump right now, uh, but for the American family. Thank you for those uh, for those comments, um, Ms. Sagan. I think there is probably consensus that the regulatory environment needs to change so that we can site new mines for rare earth minerals, so that we can produce oil and gas, so that we can site those transmission lines. Because the process right now is um, so cumbersome that I, I mean, we talk about producing those rare earths here in the United States, but good luck to anybody who wants to try to start, uh, open up a mine. You, can, you can't get it done with the process. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Congressman. I, I think there's consensus that we are entering a phase of transition. Uh, I'd like to think there's consensus that uh, we all agree that supporting reliability and affordability in our energy sector is important to the foundation of how our economy operates. And in terms of this transition, I think we need to be thoughtful about where we are in terms of 
the state of technology and the timing in which it can be deployed in an appropriate way. And the investments in infrastructure it's gonna to take to make that transition successful. I think there's consensus. While the, the details, we may have differences of opinions, we wanna approach it in that way to be thoughtful to make this transition uh, be less disruptive, more productive, and, and more successful. All right, thank you, sir. Ms. Dakin. Great, yeah, I've got a couple uh, takeaways today where we found agreement. First of all, there's definitely you, pain. You can talk more slowly. <laughs> That's just my nature. For, I got a lot fast, to say. You're a fast talker. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, from the East Coast um, originally. So, first of all, there's pain at the pump. Uh, we're all recognizing that, and, we, and something needs to be done here. Secondly, we need to protect the consumers from the volatility of oil prices spiking, and that this hasn't happened before. This happened in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, again and again and again. And as Jim was just saying here, you know, it's time to do something about this. It's time to make a change and transition. Um, I think a, a lot of us agree here that electric vehicles are the future. And it's not a matter of if, it's just when. And we're of the nature that we need to be adopting the right policies now. And I think, you know, probably others here disagree about when. But longer term, like, this is the solution. Um, well, it's the solution right now and also longer term. And then uh, finally, I think we need to be watching what China is doing um, for various, you know, points that you can come at it from, but um, certainly watch what China's doing. And my personal takeaway from you, um, Chair Carper, is that EVs are the hat trick. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that in the future. There you go. Yesterday, thank you for that. Yesterday, uh, Senator Young, uh, one, of our, one of our colleagues uh, uh, in, in the Senate, and, and I were invited to, uh, to address the nation's business leaders, business roundtable. And the, uh, uh, Jamie Dimon was the immediate past chair, and the current uh, uh, chair of the uh, National Business Roundtable is uh, Mary Barra, who was also the uh, CEO for General Motors. And I've known her for a while, and uh, about a, a couple of years ago, to maybe one or two years ago, I was talking with her, trying to urge General Motors to join uh, four or five other auto companies, uh, along with the California um, and uh, maybe 20 or so states on uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, like a timeline and reductions in time, and to see uh, see if uh, maybe GM wouldn't join half dozen auto companies that already come to agreement with a bunch of states, including California. She said, at the time, she said, um, they're not ready, GM was not ready to do that, but she, she did add this, she said, I'm all in on electric vehicles. And she said, I'm all in, that's where we're going. And she said, not only are they fun to drive, but they're a lot uh, cheaper to maintain. And she added to, to that, she said, there, there's three things that we need at General Motors, and she said auto, other auto companies, uh, American auto companies, three things that we need in order to be able to sell the vehicles if we build them. Number one, 300 mile range. Number, on recharge. Number two, the ability to recharge uh, batteries in minutes, not hours. She said the third thing that we need is for, the, uh, for the, there to be uh, charging stations throughout the country where people are driving, to the extent we can do that. She said those are the three things we need. She said the first two are on, she said the first two are on us, GM, you know, 300 mile range, the ability to charge, recharge batteries in minutes, not hours. And they have met that challenge. Uh, my wife and I own an electric vehicle now, T took the place of my two 2001 Chrysler Town and Country minivan with 600,000 miles. We, uh, we have an electric vehicle that gets, has 300 mile range, and we can charge the uh, charge battery in, in minutes, not, uh, not hours. So well, the, the industry has, has come a long ways in, in, that, uh, in, that, in that regard. The, um, and the federal government, uh, we put a lot of money in the uh, infrastructure package uh, to help with charging stations for, among other things, school buses, uh, other bu electric buses, and, and uh, just uh, general uh, electric vehicles. They, um, uh, but uh, we, uh, we still have some ways to go. We still have some ways to go. We have a lot of hearings in this uh, committee uh, hearing room. I've been on, the, uh, on this committee for, gosh, 20 years, and this is probably as important and timely a uh, hearing as we've had. And this has been a, uh, uh, just a superb, I, I, I bragged on you a little bit when I introduced you at the beginning of the hearing. And it's, this is an excellent hearing. I'm uh, grateful to, uh, to those who come from Arizona and from, uh, from Utah, sort of, from and from uh, Kathleen, uh, t tell us again where you live now. I'm in Denver. Yeah, Denver, uh, and uh, and my friend Ray Mavis. Ray Ray was uh, Secretary of uh, the Navy. I'd, I'd for years, hundred years, there'd never been a sh uh, ship, submarine, or aircraft carrier named after the state of Delaware. 
were the first eight who hadn't had a ship or anything named F after Della for 100 years. And about six, seven years ago, I called Secretary Ray Mavis and I said, Mr. Secretary, it's been 100 years or more that uh, since the ship was submarine, the aircraft carrier was named after my state. In the meantime, almost every other state, a lot of cities have had ships named after them, vessels named. And I said, do you think we could do something about it? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, let me think about it. And uh, give me a couple of months, I'll call you back. And I'm thinking, sure. And a couple of months later, he called me back. He said, the Navy's going to build a uh, contract to build four or five fast attack Virginia class nuclear submarines. And the first one will be the USS Delaware. And uh, one week from this coming Saturday, he's going to join us in Delaware with the, uh, uh, the ship's sponsor, the submarine sponsor, uh, the First Lady, uh, uh, Jill Biden. And I think she may bring a date, I'm not sure. But we'll have a couple thousand people there to welcome the USS Delaware and celebrate the one of the fastest, uh, most modern, uh, fast attack nuclear submarines in the world. So, Se Secretary Mavis, you're a hero uh, for a lot of Americans, and we're grateful for all your service and for being with us today. And I'll see you in maybe ten days or so. And with that, I think uh, I have to do some house housekeeping here uh, before we adjourn. Uh, senators will be allowed to submit written questions for the record through the close of business on Wednesday, April the 6th. We will compile those questions, send them to our witnesses. We'll ask you to reply to us by Wednesday, April the 20th. That's two weeks. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm by nature an optimistic person. And I come out of this hearing more optimistic, not less. And uh, the... Uh, what is it? What were the words of Henry Ford, founder of Ford Motor Company? I'll give Ford some equal time here after talking about GM. He, I already said that. The, uh, uh, boy, that Laurie, isn't she tough? She's a, the, uh, the founder of Ford Motor Company was Henry Ford. And among other things, Henry Ford said these words. He said, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Think about that. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And uh, on, this, on this point, on these issues, I think we can. And I think your testimonies today have brought us closer to the point where we will. So thank you very, very much. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.